<laughs> hey, we're we're live on the internet, folks. Hello, Earthlings. Danny just said that he's born ready. Born ready, always you're, ready. You're born slippy. That's, no, I'm that's not born, the, not born slippy. That's what that's what people say, isn't it? So uh, we've got, oh, we've got, got Anne, one second. We've got I'm going to have to. House. We've got Deb. See, who is gone? We've, yeah, driven, gone. we've driven him off already, <coughs> Ronald. He's, he's gone for another week. <laughs> <laughs> right. So welcome, everyone. Um, so this session today is a bit of a follow up to the session that we did, or at least Danny and I did. Uh, which wasn't long. In fact, I think it might have been the day after the Panorama program on the BBC in England, which exposed the uh, a Welsh dairy farm. And the reason that we thought we'd follow it up is because there were some matters arising, some some issues um, that I thought would be interesting once we see some of the coverage from the initial program hey philip from new york new york how you doing welcome along <laughs> there's danny with his water danny's just had his water <laughs> cut off <laughs> so i'm gonna i'm gonna have a shower in bottles of water later i'm looking forward to that mm. well, at least it's better than nothing oh my god i don't believe it so just, you can have a cold wash. shower yeah, you just wash your bits, Danny. That'd be enough, wouldn't it? For now, <laughs> which bits? You know how much so shampoo the, the, this mustache all takes. The, the dirty bits, mate. <laughs> okay, so what's going on? What have I missed? What? Where are we? Yeah, I just started the intro, saying that really we're kind of following up from the from the video that you did, which I think was that the day after the the Panorama show. It, it was it was round about either day or, or the day after. It was it was within yeah. it was in forty eight hours of it going out because I thought it's a really important thing to highlight as well. And um, yeah, we're going to talk about the repercussions of it after. Um, yeah, that, that that that's a general idea. I mean, I think I think we can basically say that we all come to this from an abolitionist point of view, not to be confused with the abolitionist uh, point of view, but an abolitionist point of view and um and then it's a question of for me as a sociologist it's a question of movement claims making a point that i kind of made quite a few times in the first video which is on on um dan's channel so um it's actually it's actually had about almost like five thousand views now danny is that right yeah it's done it's done really well yeah yeah mm. it's, but but you see what happens is once something like this goes out Farmers jump on, and as you know, YouTube is 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 very all about interaction um, because it's ads related. YouTube is ad related, so the the more interactions that YouTube see on on a certain video, the more it gets suggested out there. And obviously, these farmers are spreading this like wildfire everywhere, and they're coming on and commenting and saying, you know, this is not typical. This is not how we do things, and. And then people who are arguing back. So yeah, the, the the comment section is what drove this, I think. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I've got some examples of some of the things that the farmers um, are saying for for a little bit later. So, Ronnie, you didn't actually have you seen the program yet? Um, I've, I've seen Danny's video. I didn't watch the program. I don't watch things like that. I don't watch things that show animals being harmed because I don't need to. I'm vegan already. You know, I'm doing vegan outreach. I don't need to traumatise myself anymore. I already know about it, so I don't watch those programmes. I watch Danny's. Um, uh, I watch Danny's video, but I, I kind of, I, I, I kind of fast forwarded through the bit where he showed the clips from the film. But I heard the discussion at the end. Right. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to um, show a little PowerPoint in a minute, just to kind of set the scene and raise a few questions for the for the session, really. And then um, after that, um, and we talk about that a little bit, perhaps we're probably going to open it up for an open mic. So um, we, we'll we'll do that. And once 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 this PowerPoint goes, it'll it'll create space, because I've um, this is a free version of of uh, Streamyard, so it means I. We've limited to six people at a well, time. 
Well, believe me, Roger, I've had six people on StreamYard at the same time, and it is like conducting an orchestra of people that cannot play. It is a nightmare. So, yeah, let's hope we don't do that. But I'd just like to to add to everybody, though, um, I think, are you going to put it in the comments, Roger, the, the link? Well, we, we, we could do. I mean, if if if, um, if people are in the comments and they don't have the link and they want it, we, we, we could okay. do. Although, obviously, that's the, the more dangerous thing to do, isn't it, in a sense? But, yeah, again, yeah, but again, people come into the, as it were, green room before, so it's not as though I'll be letting people on that I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing the thing is, though, people, um, if you do decide to come on, and you've got something to say, and you are sh- feeling shy. Um, what it does do is, when you click the link, it asks to operate your camera, and it asks to operate your your mic, and you can click no for the camera, so you don't have to show your face if you if you feel a little bit shy about coming on and speaking to us. So, oh, I should have um, done that. I'm shy. I yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I know you are. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> funny enough, I am, I am actually quite a shy person. Funny enough, but uh, yeah, it, I'm one, I'm one of those people that I can speak to. When I used to do the lecturing, one of my lectures was in the big lecture room at UCD, and there's 500 students, and I'm I'm okay with talking to 500 people, but in a kind of small party kind of situation, I get really don't like I don't like that very much, and never have. But anyway, that's by the by. Okay, so let me uh, let me, whoops. Add to stream. There we go. Okay, so um, for those who don't know and didn't see the original Panorama um, issue, what they did was they had a, an ethical dairy farm, and then they had the dairy farm that they were almost like exposing, and that used footage which was filmed by an undercover uh, person from Animal Equality. So... Um, so this is what they initially say about this. Uh, they they open up with um, the issue about cruelty. Um, I mean, the second, um, you know, the, the 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 line, the second kind of line. I wouldn't mind, you know, releasing disturbing un- under uh, cover footage of deliberate violence and neglect. We've lost Ronnie again. You just don't like us today, Ronnie. He's no, I've got, I've got a bit of a problem. I've got an alarm. An alarm went off my phone and it killed the sound on the um, <laughs> on the show for some mad reason. This is what happens when you buy a Nokia 3310 from 1982. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, hopefully it'll be all right now. I've, I've turned it off, so we'll see. And, and then the, the, the other uh, initial thing that I would point out about this slide is is the focus on factory farms which is an interesting um, focus from an abolitionist point of view rather than, as it were, animal farming uh, in general. We just had a little little chat about this. And um, Danny, you've done a little bit of undercover work. Is that right? Are we allowed to say that or what? No, uh, I've done some farm infiltration, yeah. Um, I can't talk about the undercover work at the moment, um, but I can talk about the farm infiltration, of which tonight I'll be going doing another one. Um, so what do you okay. want to know about that? Well, in terms of, of actual undercover work where you actually get get a job in some in somebody's farm or laboratory, which is which is what they did in this case. Mm-hmm. And there's been there's been um, these have, have happened, especially in laboratories right from the 80s. I and mean, Ronnie will remember all that. You know, a, a lot of people um, worked for the NAVs and the BYV and, you know, that they, they got jobs as um in fact, the uh, the shack thing that was an undercover thing, wasn't it? You know where they uh, there was some really bad violence towards beagles, and mm-hmm. that was caught by an undercover camera. And I suppose it was harder in those days because the cameras would have been a lot bigger. Was now, <laughs> yeah. So now, now there are kind of these button cameras and everything. I imagine it's a lot easier in a sense. But the thing that I th- was wondering about is the fact that um, the undercover person was there for several months. And so that uh, raises an interesting issue, uh, but it, there's some nuances to it. For example, it could be that it takes you quite a long time to kind of integrate yourself into the system and to get trusted by people and just be able to walk around uh, the, the place rather than being stuck in your work place, et cetera, and that kind of stuff. Okay, so, so yeah, I can, I can mention that, yeah. So yeah. In, in, any, in any job, 
you know, you, you walk into a job as a newbie, um, nobody knows anything about you. They, they probably wasn't, definitely weren't local people. So, you know, you've got to think about questions that arise by employers and by people who already work there. Like, why is this person suddenly come working at this farm? He's not local because, as you know, these small villages and towns, everybody knows everybody. So, yeah, you've got to build confidence and you've got to you've got to be a character, haven't you? So you've got to be this character. You've got to have answers for everything. Where do you live? Why are you here? Where do you go? You know, you've got to know the streets. You've got to know which local pub, you know, you've got it. There's a lot to, to, to sort of convince people you, you are who you are, even though you're not, you know. So, yeah, it can take weeks. And then, of course, people are watching you like a hawk. So they're seeing, can he do the job? Can she do the job? Are they capable of doing the job? You know, and once they see that you're a grafter, you turn up for work on time, you do the job, you're learning, that's it. Because, of course, if you start a new job and you you can get away with asking questions, but as time goes on, then you will have a problem if you're asking too many questions. So that's another thing you've got to watch as well. So it's very complex. It's not a case of just going in and, and, and filming stuff. You, you've got to build build a rapport with everybody. You've got to gain the trust. You've got to, got to learn where, what you can get away with. You've got to test yourself to see what you can get away with. Can I get away with going into this back shed on my own? Can I get away with walking away and being, being off people's radar for, for half an hour maybe? There's a lot to take in. Um, when you're hiding cameras on your person, do they expect you to wear overalls? Do they expect you to sort of like, is the searches involved when you leave or when you come in? Have you got a locker? There's, there's so much to it before you can actually start gathering evidence. Mm, do you know what? One thing, one thing that is always an issue, and I reckon it'll be harder now than what it was before, Wendy, in the 1980s, um, was the fact that um, a lot of the investigators that they used to employ weren't vegan, whereas now the chances are that, that anybody who goes into these places are probably going to be more likely to be vegan. So I've always thought, you know, like what happens at, at break time, you know, I that, that, kind that. Of thing. So what you do is you take things like um, beef and tomato pot noodles, which are vegan. You find anything that looks like real chicken, or real beef, which there's a hell of a lot now. So nobody's going to start examining your sandwiches. You know, if something looks like salami, they're going to assume it's salami. I mean, I've never looked at anyone's sandwiches and thought, oh, what's that on the sandwiches? I've just, you know, <laughs> read the paper and watched videos and that's it. So, yeah, but it, it, it's, it's, all about, it's all about creating an illusion. But there's plenty of, plenty of scope out there for, for fooling people with your food choices while you're in there. Hmm. Yeah, so that was the first issue on this. The other, the other, the other one is that um, there's suddenly, and you'll see, you'll see throughout this little presentation in a way, there's, um, there's a focus on legal uh, or welfare violations. And so that for me is always a red flag because I'm, I'm thinking, well, look, you know, we're, t we're talking about an animal use facility. And so therefore, that means systematic routine animal rights violations. And then the good chance is that on top of that, there's going to be um, things which are breaking the existing regulations and also things that you could label as animal cruelty, you know, on, on top of the thing. So my fundamental position is based on fundamentals in the sense that the fundamental problem of animal use is the rights violations. And on top of that, to make things worse, there is there are different levels of cruelty and my general position uh, i don't know whether you'll agree with this uh, you two but my general position is that you can go into any animal use facility and, and the ones that i i mean i've been into a couple myself with cameras and stuff and you can generally find something that is pretty distasteful so there's always going to be levels of what you could call animal cruelty but what is certain is you'll always find animal rights violations and so that's my fundamental position. And I think that that really would be the basis of my claims making as well. So if I was talking about it, I wouldn't be focusing necessarily on the cruelty. I'd be focusing on the fact that we're exposing rights violations and also this and that and the other happened as well. Yeah. So that would be my kind of fundament, fundamental kind of uh, position on that. I don't know whether you'd agree with that general thing i mean that really is is taken from tom reagan she's basically saying you know there, there are fundamental problems moral problems in places of animal use 
and it's not the level of cruelty it's the rights violations but there is going to be different levels of cruelty as well so that's that's like a, a secondary issue uh, to me that the primary issue to me is always the rights violations so the, these are the things that um, the group is saying are common amongst the system and I we would all agree with this so you go into a dairy farm and you're going to find lameness this euthanasia problem is an interesting one from a vegan point of view because they were basically saying that they weren't killing them fast enough or they weren't calling out a vet fast enough which is interesting violence of course um and violence struck rights violations as far as i'm concerned and then you got mother and calf separation which is which is an interesting one because from the farming point of view and of course they do try to answer back these allegations and they've tried to make this a welfare issue now and so they've tried to say that it's actually good for the mother and for the calf to be separated and there is some research that suggests that that's the case in the same way as they make artificial insemination into a welfare issue as well and there are some welfare strands to artificial insemination uh, so again these are nuanced kind of uh, things but generally speaking yes you're, you're going to find rights violations if you go into a farm levels of cruelty as well now this is an issue that you raised yourself danny in your first video which was the fact that there's a claim about the level of cruelty was caused by the fact that they're not getting much money and of course you're going to say it makes no difference and you know my position would be you know you give them a million quid and they'll still be violating the rights of other animals but the the bits from this bit that i wanted to pick out are, are, are these bits here uh so starts off with um welfare higher uh welfare issues which has been a, a focus of a few groups lately kind of exposing the the higher welfare things that to me is a little bit irrelevant to be honest the the thing about red tractor these welfare certificates and you made the point danny in your first video that that's an industry criteria anyway it was designed by the farming industry to it, it's, it's designed and run by the farmers for the yeah. farmers so it, it, it means it, nothing yeah it's to make it's to make them look good yeah that's right and so i'm i'm not i'm not quite sure what we're we supposed to make of the fact that this well this is supposed to be a red tractor thing i mean i suppose the point being made is that they're lying to the public i suppose right which is which is which is a point no I'd, I'd 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 disagree with that so let's say let's say um i get an award for driving safely in my wagon so the people come and check me and they say go on done you drive down that road and i drive down the road and i don't hit any curbs or any pedestrians or any animals and I, I do really well and they go right okay so you're on the safe driver certificate now there you go well done Guy gets out, I jump back in my wagon, oh, I'm late, bang my foot down, run over the curb, hit a few cars in my rush to get home to go to the pub or something like that. So, you know, this, these certificates and everything, they're not even a good thing because what happens is, is, is that once they've been given and once they've got, people don't necessarily need to stick to it then until the next time they get inspected. So it's hmm. yeah it's not very well regulated and it's it's and as you've heard before they always give a phone call saying oh we're going to come and inspect your farm next week at such a time yeah that's right what 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 the group is calling for to improve the situation is for inspections to happen about every two or three years well from a point of view of ongoing rights violations what's the point of that right from our point of view it's kind of well, you know, it it it's all it's almost. I mean, that, that's part, that's a part and parcel of, of what the petition was all about. Is saying to the government, you've got to step up to the plate and regulate this better. They they even said that because they can't investigate all the farms. Ironically, the people behind the red tractor scheme said that they can't inspect all the farms either. So there's got to be an element of goodwill in the system. And of course, from our point of view, that means that that 
that situation is going to be abused be, because they know they're not going to be inspected you know they don't they don't have to even live up to the standards that they pretend that they're living up to you know but the different levels of, of it so you know I, I i wouldn't i wouldn't put much traction on picking out the red tractor side of things myself i mean obviously it, it it's something that you could mention but i noticed that a lot of groups are trying to say well look this was a red tractor farm this was a a so-called high welfare farm and this kind of stuff as though that makes much of a difference to us from an rights point of view it doesn't it's it's just a farm which says that it's got high welfare so what you know i mean but again this is where i sort of i've had time to think about it and um sometimes you've got to look at it from the victim's point of view and i mean no, we're not fighting for welfare. I, I totally agree. And as vegans and as animal rights activists, we want abolition, but we also don't want animals to suffer during the time until we get what we're, we're after, till we get it abolished, till we get a vegan world. We, we, want, we want less suffering. It is, if, if I was one of those victims being whipped and kicked and hit with shovels and abused every day, and they sent me to a higher welfare farm where they look after me better. That'd be better for me. That'd be better for me. And I don't think any vegans out there or any animal rights activists out there would 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 say it it it's weakening the vegan argument. It's weakening the animal rights argument at all. I think everybody knows once people go vegan that they know that that this is wrong right at the base level. They know this is wrong no matter what. We get it. Um, but this also helps a lot of people. I mean, AV has changed and helped so many people go vegan. It's, it, it's staggering, you know. And I know it's not, some of it's isolated, like this is isolated. But when you show people this, it, you know, it, it's very productive. For people to see and all right you might get some and say well if they stop doing that then i'm going to carry on buying but those people wouldn't go vegan anyway those people you know don't care anyway so oh yeah but i'm, I'm not arguing against the the film and the distribution of the exposes i'm not i'm not arguing against that because uh, i think we've said this before that you you have to have a steady stream i mean you don't you don't need to do it every week but you have to have a steady stream of footage because we all know, all three of us know, that the first thing they say is, where was this filmed? And the second thing they say is, when was this filmed, right? And so if it's more than four or five years old, they're going to say, well, that probably doesn't happen anymore. Well, I, th I think Dominion's quite old now. I think Dominion hmm. is, is getting on to at least... I think it's if someone can check for me in the comments how old Dominion is. Well, I think um, it's about four and a half, five years. I yeah. bet it's getting on to four years, definitely. Um, yeah. I don't think it's five years yet because I've I've been vegan five years, nearly six now, and I think it was a couple of years in before Dominion came out. The first thing I watched was Fox Over Knives. Now that is quite an old, an old, an film. old one, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. so what what we normally say then is that that's standard anyway, and and of course there there is another nuance in the sense that. <clears throat> We know, and we'll see this when we get to the farmers, we know that every group of farmers in every country claim to have the best welfare in the world or, or something like that, you know. Um, neglecting the fact that it's not actually possible. Within a globalized system of, pro of production, it couldn't happen. You couldn't have a country stepping outside of what's the norm and unless they're unless they're going to make it very difficult for themselves, completely raise their, their own costs, and therefore they would have to pass that on to the customer. And so if you really were an outstanding welfare nation compared with the rest of the world, as they often claim, your products would be incredibly expensive compared with every, everywhere else because you've got to have the same equipment, you've got to have the same systems, you've got to be able to compete in terms of volume, in terms of turnover, uh, when we talked about peace, peace work, and this kind of stuff, and so 
even if they wanted to do it, I mean, say you had a group of, of, of farmers who actually wanted to do it, it would be incredibly difficult for them to do. And I think, Danny, that was even borne out by this welfare dairy, oh, wasn't it? I mean, that was absolutely ridiculous. For those of you who didn't see it, this welfare farmer, he keeps the calves um, with the mothers. He only takes half the milk and he makes his money off, off, the, prod, off the milk by creating an artisan cheese. But his whole point by the end of it, when he, he sort of said, right, okay, you get these calves, is that he said that the calves grow much quicker and much healthier on the mother's milk. So then we can send them to slaughter uh, a lot heavier than, than would be on formula. So the end goal is, is exactly the same. There's no difference. It was nothing about welfare. It was about, it was about appeasing to people's sensibilities, I think, and saying, look, I'm, I keep my calves with, my, with, with the mothers, you know, I'm special. It was quite you know? a coup for them, wasn't it? It was quite it a was, coup. It was, it was. For, but... for, for, for that, you've got the BBC declaring that this guy was an ethical dairy farm. I mean, that, that, is, that is quite a badge, a badge, isn't it, to have? And, but this is the thing. Nobody in the right mind would see that and think... I mean, I, I, again, I'm generalising and, and, and speaking, but I shouldn't really speak for people. But, I mean, who in the right mind, after watching that, would think, oh, yeah, that's, that's a lot more ethical. That's, that's really nice what he's doing. He keeps the calves with, with the mothers, and then he, 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 he still kills them, though. He's like... There's no difference, and this this is what get, puts people off dairy is the fact that we take take the children off the mothers and kill the children if they're male, you know, or put put the females into the same same abusive cycle as the mothers. It's just, yeah, it's it, we've got to keep exposing it. We really have got to keep exposing it. Oh yeah, I to I totally agree with that. And um, I mean, a couple a couple of points. I mean, we're, we're running to, into culture here, the issue of culture because. People, um, Dominion was released in 2018. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I put that up on the screen. Um, yeah. Uh, um, oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's four years old. So, yeah. Um, but... <laughs> there, there's a good one. The same logic as by water, which is, uh, which is quite good. Oh, well, there was smart water. Do you remember that? I drunk gallons of it and I didn't get any smarter. So... Um... <laughs> Uh, Kevin is, says ill, ill fare rather than welfare. Yeah. So th th there is that as well. But Race Lever says a good thing at 6.53. He says abolition is the goal, but improving welfare, if no other option exists currently, is better than nothing if it's a real improvement. And that's the key, if it's a real improvement. You know, like the, the chickens in the battery farms is, is like these, you know, um, um, taking them out of the cages, but just putting them in well, one in, giant in cage. Rich cages, yeah. No, not um, in rich cages. You know, oh, just the barn situation. Yeah, the, just the, the barn the, situation. The real, the real problem is when you're trying to what I call regulate atrocities. You've got a major problem all the way down the line here. First of all, you've got to be able to try and work out in advance what would be a real improvement. Then you've got to try and bring it about and and get. Uh, then you've got to try and enforce it, and then you've got to try to enforce it over time, which which is which is a major problem, you know. Th there is an answer to this from an abolitionist point of view, which is contained in the work of a sociologist called Richard Gale. You'd be interested in this. He basically says that if you present an abolitionist animal rights position, you'll get welfare anyway. And the reason that works is this, that instead of thinking, thinking about us as a movement and the farmers as a counter movement you've got to think of a third party which is the state or the state agencies and so if we create what i used to call social turbulence and just you know some some trouble get press coverage you're on the radio and that kind of stuff you're talking about rights violations and everything what happens then is the the minister who's getting all this flack and getting difficult questions from the press, gets onto the user and they go, look, you've got to do something. I'm getting a load of shit here. And then the only thing they can do is improve, improve the welfare. So then they try to improve the welfare. They go back to the minister and say, well, we've done this, we've done that, and we sweep the yard four times a day instead of three and this kind of stuff. And then the minister then tries to placate the public 
who've been roused up by the animal rights claims with welfare because that's the only thing they can do they can't they can't answer us about animal rights violations because the implication of animal rights is abolition always the implication of animal welfare is that we might be able to clean it up which is the which is the first thing that they think of be they politicians be they the farmers be they the regulators so that will be the difference so you can still get welfare by making animal rights claims you, d you don't you don't have to ask for welfare you get it anyway mm. I'd, I'd like to say i agree with that and of course the thing is there is there is always an option and and the option is to educate people to go vegan mm. and um films like this can can help with that because they get publicity you know they kind of um you know get people watching but what's really important is the message that goes with um something like that and that message shouldn't be oh we need to you know th th these farms need to stop being cruel they need to stop treating the animals like that that shouldn't be the message that that's put out um, uh, with these exposés the message that's put out should be um even that even on um farms where that doesn't happen you've still got calves sent for slaughter at a day old i think the last figures i saw for the uk ninety thousand day old male calves a year are, are, are killed whether that's still the same I, I i think it probably is very much like that and then also all the cows get slaughtered at about six years old when they have an average lifespan of 15 to 20 years. And that's universal. And that needs to be said as well. That, 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 that you can't get out, you can't avoid these things, even where people aren't kicking cows and stuff. Yeah, but I mean, it's, they're still going to be killed. This, the calves are still going to be killed. And so the only answer, if people don't want these animals um, to be oppressed, the only answer is veganism, and that should be the message that goes out with those things. Now, if that leads to the government bringing in um, better welfare measures, then that's up to them. But what we should be trying to do is use these things to educate people to go vegan, and yeah, and that's a much better you. use of, of energy. It's much better. We gain far more by putting our energy into vegan education than we do into trying to obtain welfare improvements. I agree yeah. totally, but the, the problem we've got, Ronnie, is that this was a panorama show. All right, the the I'm not sure whether the activists, the undercover guys, were vegan. I'm not sure about that. But panorama, as will ha it was BBC. It was massive reach. You're talking at, at minimum three, four million people would watch that. But it's not a vegan show. It's not vegan people behind it. The 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 reason for the program wasn't to promote veganism it was to create a story and, and make money for the people who make the programs so that message would never accompany something like that so that's why i felt it was important to take that footage and i'm so glad that that the uh, the the guys released it for free use on their website so that i could actually replicate the show and uh, because uh, as you know on youtube you put anything up from the bbc channel 4 itv you get blocked and you get you get copyright strikes and all sorts yeah, it's a nightmare copyright. so yeah. i was so happy to be able to replicate it but again we need to use that that information to to do what you say ronnie is yes. to is to, to show people but the, what i felt was the danger was and, and this is the whole point of this this conversation between us all is the danger is if we show that footage and people say, well, if they stop doing that, I can happily then carry on buying dairy products. That's the danger, what we've got to keep our eye on. And it means that we've all got to be educate ourselves on how to tackle that. And, and yeah, say, well, we're well, not in control of that, though, are we? But no, the we're thing not in is, control. Well, and, and it's very difficult when you're dealing with journalists. It's particularly difficult when you're dealing with journalists to, 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 to take an animal liberation or animal rights position because they're so used to hearing welfare claims from the movement that they automatically either translate what you say down to welfare or they just kind of mm. copy and paste from other stuff that is all over the place so it's cruelty abuse and all the rest of it and so if if you're if you're really careful with the journalist you can 
try to encourage them by kind of trying to educate them as journalists not to replicate what other journalists have done. So, so, so there is that. But the point is, this what you're seeing on your screen, Danny. This is not panorama. This is animal equality. So, going going back to what Ronnie said, uh, and there's two I, uh, there's two examples of this. Th this is from that big long thing that was about money from the previous slide, and and in this little section towards the end, it says ultimately the best way to help cows and their babies is to ditch dairy and all animal products. Now they say this kind of thing twice within this big appeal for the regulation and the licensing regime to be to be um strengthened now it's interesting to me that they don't use the word vegan for a start off and of course that goes back to what ronnie just said there's no there's no strong go vegan message here even from animal equality and and so if they were pushing that and they could have got that on Panorama, that would have been better than what we had because it's all right having a program going at 3 million people. If the program's got a bad message, what's the, what's the, what's the good of that? And so you've yeah, got... Well, a... Yeah, but again, you're talking about editors, right? So, oh, no, yeah. So again, I've got to stress that these people are in it for the message. They are in it to be angels for the vegan movement or angels. No, but for, they're asking for, you for, the, for your for position. I mean, they would have asked Animal Equality for their position. You know, I mean, I mean, they could have started off well. Ultimately, we're a vegan group, but or whatever, right? But would they have said that on this TV show? Well, the, the the way you can, I mean, I, I was on a TV show in Ireland and, and, and it was all about rights violations because that's the only fucking thing I would say. <laughs> because this, this guy this guy asked me the same question about 15 times. And I answered it this, the same way about 15 times. Was well, anyone he, from Animal Equality interviewed on the, um, in the Panorama uh, program? I, I think they talked to the undercover guy. Yeah, the undercover guy was there, yeah. Well, that and, person could have said something about veganism. Whether they'd have included it in the program is another matter. He but, might. This yeah. is what I mean, Ronnie. Yeah. He might have. He might have said, "Right, let me go back to Veganville, BBC One." Right, I went to see a dairy farmer, and it was it was that that girl who's who's on every single sort of. She's a spokesman for for the the National Farmers Union, the NFU, and I hit her with all sorts. And she came back to me. But because it's the BBC, they had to even out the argument. So even though I gave her five or six points against and she only gave me one back, we still only had one one on every section of the video. So it's, yeah. But, the, it, but that, that's why the, the job of a spokesperson is quite difficult to not, to not be drawn into, into the welfare thing. I mean, like there was a prominent... Um, person from the movement on tv and he got suckered into a big conversation about the percentage of times when slaughterhouses successfully stunned other animals before the, their throats were, were cut which is not relevant from an animal rights point of view but a long section of of, of the and we all know from a tv thing you you know you usually got you know one or, or two contributions and that's it you're gone type of thing so you've got to make sure that the main thing you want to say is the main thing you say and that if there's stuff that you don't want them to show you don't say it so it, it's not it's not as easy as just having a chat no you're not at all you've got to be versed you've got to be i mean look at joy when he goes on tv shows he, he said to me he says i've got i know i've got 90 seconds to get my point out. And what those hosts will do is distract him and interrupt and put you under pressure. And you've got to be very, very good if you're going and to gang go. gang up on you as well. They'll of gang course, up on you. of course, mm. yes. Mm. Yes, so but, it, uh, it's a very tricky situation. But you see, our, our argument is really simple. It's that, you know, animals are being um, sent for slaughter when we don't need to eat them when we can live perfectly well without that. And so therefore that's wrong and end of argument. You'd like to think it that way, Ronnie, wouldn't well, it, you? But it is end of argument that it can't be justified, can it? It can't be justified 
to kill animals. Yeah, but I mean, as soon as you killed. say say that phrase again, it can't it can't be justified, can it? Nobody can justify it morally that the animals animals are being um, reared and killed to feed humans when we can live perfectly well on a vegan diet and yeah, but we, no case, no sorry we need we need meat to live we need meat for protein we need calcium it, 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 for, for healthy bones but, running but i'm obvi- very sorry obvi- that's we need that but it's you obvious that that's it's obvious that that's not the case uh, and animals massive- are here animals rear and rear those animals would go extinct if it weren't for us anyway thank you ronnie um and on to our next <laughs> section do you see what i mean it's like no, people can but, but it's, it's not. They dilute. Then they dilute your message. You, you can go on a TV show and you can say, and you can get it down to, to like seven words, and you can bang, 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 bang. But then they start hitting the questions, and then before you can answer those questions, it's like bang. See you later. On to the next. It's that's true, and that is why it's really important, um, as was said, to say what you need to say straight away. Well, yeah, well, or well, repeat well, it. Let, let, let's not always let, let's not forget that Ronnie's probably done more TV than anybody around uh, yeah. when, when he when he was a national press officer for the ALF. But um, uh, go, go, um, w- w- without without wanting to have a go, going back to um, Joey, the main thing Joey talks about is cruelty. So he he spends that time that limited time that he's got talking about cruelty. He d- he doesn't talk about the fundamentals of the problem, and so that I would think is a is is a problem now. I think that the recent spokespersons, let's, let's call them that, it's not their fault in the same in the sense that they've been socialised by an animal welfare movement. Our movement talks about cruelty. That's our main claims making. The main thing we ever say is don't be cruel. And so, therefore, there's people who come into the movement and they've been in movement, what, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine years now. They came into a movement where that was the dominant way of talking because the dominant um, philosophy in the movement is animal welfare, not animal rights. And so that, that that's a problem. You've got to stand outside of the movement a little bit like Francione has done, actually physically left the movement to, to be an animal rights person. You, 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 you find yourself rather alienated from your own movement. I, I feel alienated from the animal movement because of its welfare base all the time. I mean, I, I in in our chat before we came on, I I sent a picture, didn't I? And I had, you know, end factory farming and about four hundred <laughs> signs, you know, and and you'd think, well, is is that what they want to to end factory farming? And so we we get used to the fact that we are a welfare movement that calls itself something else, usually calls itself an animal rights movement, usually rejects the philosophy of animal rights, but that's that's another issue. So there is that, but in terms of when you've talking to a journalist you've really got limited time as we all agree and so the number one rule is say what you mainly want to say and say that first that's the number one rule mm, and i agree that, yeah which is what politicians do you know i mean everyone makes a joke about it don't they that the politician will answer the question that they want to be asked rather than the question that they were asked we we have to do that as well to some extent does anybody want to come on and, and chat with us? I think we'll be open if Ronnie if uh, Roger wants to throw on the throw on the link to join, um, and we'll carry on. But yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you talk about Joy, but but I mean, look at Joy's performance, Roger. It's oh, I'm like, not, I don't I don't want to have a go. Don't don't get me wrong. I don't. No, want no, to have no a go. I'm not. I'm not. You know? I'm not saying you're having a go. I, I'm, I thought we we're here to talk things through. So um, yeah, we'll save the fight for when I come over to Ireland. Um, <laughs> Right. Okay, I'm just uh, getting the uh, the thing here. There we go. Well, yeah, I, I think, th- I think I th- one thing to say is it's um, is it a good thing that that appeared on the television that in 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 the form that it did, or would it have been better had it not appeared on the television at all? No, I think it was a really good thing. It's turned a hell of a lot of people off dairy. Um, I don't think anybody would assume that this was isolated. Um, even some of the stuff they showed on there wasn't really cruelty. It was standard practice, down cows, uh, cows suffering. You know, it, it, 
a lot of it was was just standard practice anyway. It wasn't unusual. So I think it was a really good thing, and a lot of people have reacted to that and said, you know, I, 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 yeah, I cannot exposing stomach animal anymore. exposing animal use is our job, I would say, and you are you are right there because the farmers have saying, okay, well, that they they had this ho hoist situation, but that's sta that's standard in in our, in our industry, so that that that's not a problem. And so what they try and do, of course, to justify it, as always, is they have to talk welfare. So, what, so whether you're talking about separating mothers and children or artificial insemination or hoisting or anything like that, they will make a welfare point out of it. And my, my thing is that we don't join in with the welfare paradigm. We contradict that with animal rights and we, in a sense, cut through that. So we don't have to then argue about how many percentage of, of cows get stunned properly as, as though as though that matters for us it, it might matter for the rspca but we're not the rspca we're we're, all, we're almost got i mean this goes back to ronnie ronnie did a recent interview where he made this really interesting distinction between militancy and radicalism and he said that in the 1980s and i was there as well we became militant but we didn't become radical and at the moment we've almost like got a militant version of the RSPCA going where you've got vegan activists they go in and they get the footage and the footage is very powerful very useful and all the rest of it and then what do we do we make animal welfare claims about it and then demand that the farm gets closed down or demand that the the farmer uh fires the workers uh, or we demand that the government uh, ramp up the welfare you know uh, uh, they license it this this is this is all of what this petition connected to this all this is about asking the government to do better in order to protect animals that's how that's how it's put right they they can't protect animals if they're trying to regulate how they're used bred transported and killed that's always going to be a rights violation you know and it doesn't matter if they have a couch for each and every one it, and a limo, in a limo to the slaughterhouse, it's still a rights violation. So we don't need to get bogged down in all that welfare stuff. And we certainly don't need, as vegan activists, to spend our time, money and effort trying to get the government to bring in a licensing system. So that means that these type of farms are going to be inspected every couple of years. Yeah, but I mean, if they did bring in something like that, wouldn't that cause costs to the farmers and wouldn't that raise well, you argued the price against that yourself meat. a minute ago sorry you argued against that yourself because you said they always know when they're going to be inspected yeah but i mean let's just say in 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 this unusual circumstances of they do do random on the spot inspections and it means that then the farmers do have to keep up the standards very very high what i'm saying is Anything that pushes up the pain yeah, to the farmers and, of and increases the price of meat then pushes more people to sort of... It, it, it's all it's all ifs and buts, Danny, unfortunately. Of course because, it's ifs and buts. I mean, yeah. there's no other way about it's, it's it. The it's the same it's... with the fact that we had a long campaign in Britain to bring in uh, cameras into slaughterhouses. And now we've got another group, the Animal Justice Project, exposing the fact it doesn't do any good. No, it doesn't. Yeah, but the point is, the the aim of that was what you're saying. Well, that means that it's going to make them be more careful. They're going to be more careful about how they put put other animals through slaughterhouses. And the the claims about the and Ronnie will remember this. In fact, he's one of your favourite groups, Ronnie. It, it it the the claims were this would make a big difference if we can get if we can get cameras into slaughterhouses. Just the idea of it. Just think, wow, they can't just do what they want now because there's these cameras. And then, of course, you get to all the details of, you know, who's actually looking at the screen and all that kind of stuff, and it all falls apart. Hmm. So an industry regulating itself, and we talked about this on your on your video. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I meant I, I meant an outside body regulating it, not not the, the industry regulating itself. Who? Who? I, the, the other thing is all this energy that's going into all this 
the energy that's going into producing that petition, sharing it all around, the energy that went into that campaign to get the cameras, put that energy into vegan education. That's going to yield far, far more positive results. You know, people are, are, are pissing around, you know, on these welfareist things, using their energy on it. And put that energy into vegan education and encourage people to do vegan education instead of signing a petition for a welfareist demand get out there and do vegan education um, i mean I, I do i do agree totally i mean i do agree totally what my 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 whole existence now is is about getting as many people to 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 look and 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 become vegans themselves um evidence gathering you know my youtube doing everything i can so I agree totally with that. I'm I'm not on board with any any welfare argument whatsoever, um, but I do think that that we we do, we do need to keep on exposing the the, the exceptional cruelty as well, because like, I think that helps um, all the way through. Um, why, why, can't, why can't we expose it as animal use equals rights violations? Because when you. <laughs> But I don't think people... Panorama would have done that. That's the, the problem is if you're relying on, as Danny said earlier, if you're relying on the kind of conventional media to, you know, put something on the television, then it goes into their hands and they, they'll do well, it. Even if they want. It, say that was the case, say, say that was the case, that we were sat there in animal equality room and said, look, we can't say anything about rights to Panorama. But that doesn't stop them saying a lot about rights afterwards. No, no, mm -hmm. I agree. I, I, I agree. And 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 and, and, they, and they haven't done this. I mean, we, we, we're, yeah. we're looking at we, what what yeah. they're doing is they're they're not saying rights. They're not even saying go vegan. There's a little hint. In fact, I'm going to turn this off in a, in a minute because in case people come on. But just I just want to zip through to to one little bit uh, for the for the last one, if you like. And this is the second time here where they talk about. Um, Every time you choose a plant-based option instead of dairy, you're making a positive difference for them. Again, it was it was quite it's quite a shock to me to find that in 2022 there's still some international and national groups which are scared of the word vegan, and I didn't think that that would be the case anymore. This the, the bottom um, right there looking love veg, mm -hmm. right. Um, I was quite shocked when I saw that because we used to have to deal with all that bullshit about 10 years ago where you had you had reduced vegetarians like Tobias Leonard telling people that veganism was a scare word. And then, of course, you've, you've got it all over Tesco and Morrison's and, and, and everywhere else. And the the people who make the, the stuff, they're not scared of the word vegan. And yet we've still got groups in the movement full of vegans scared of the word vegan and so they they want to put love veg instead right so this is we're into francione territory here because the reason for that is that the, the animal equality are going to have a lot of vegetarian subscribers and they don't want to alienate them too much that, that that's 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 the issue which, which is why if you look at the bottom uh, i'm going to turn this off now but the bottom left that there is a screen from the open philanthropy project and that is all the animal welfare grants that animal equality have had over five years from the Open Philanthropy Project for battery cage campaigns, higher welfare campaigns, this kind of stuff. And the grants amount to $11 million. $11 million over five years. Mercy for Animals are the same. It's, it's not exclusively, I mean, I'm not trying to pick on this group or anything just that this was the group behind that, that that expose and and so they've got you know they they're vegan towards the vegans and they're welfareists towards the welfareists and, and all the rest of it and, and all that mm. well, yeah but i mean you, i was gonna say if you just have a campaign that's go vegan then you <laughs> there's not all these different things to get grants for because it's just the same message isn't it mm. i mean i mean see my my sort of thoughts on that are like we're not going to see a vegan world in the next 10, 15 years. We're not going to see that. We're going to see a vast increase in numbers, vast. But I think in the meantime, we need to, we need to improve conditions for all the animals who are going through this. Just 
as putting yourself in their shoes. And I don't think that's a welfareist argument. I think that's just genuine compassion for the animals. Does that make sense, or does that sound like I'm, I'm you speaking get welfareism? But I think Roger like, covered this, uh, covered that earlier, didn't he? Yeah, but I mean, we, we, there's veganism. no reason we can't. There's no reason we can't go over it again. And and like, I mean, the whole point is just to to sort of thrash this out. And yeah, I might mm. be playing devil's advocate along the way, but I mean, it's a long game. It's going to be a very very long game. And if I was a victim of this long game, and I'm sat in that farm. And I would want, yes, to it be, for it to be ended and to get my liberty and my freedom. Yes, that would be my optimal goal. But in the meantime, I'd want to be not being whipped every day, not to be abused every day. So I think we need to sort of, there's a fine balancing line between what we're well, heading for and what we need to do in the meantime. Well, what I would say to that, Danny, is that we are vegan abolitionists. And so that's that's our focus. So we've got the Richard Gale thing, which I've mentioned already. And on top of that, you've got the fact that you've got the RSPCAs and new humane societies. And there are more vegetarians than vegans. There are more reducitarians than vegetarians and vegans. So if there's less than vegan work to do, this is division of labor stuff. Let them do it. Instead of, instead of that, we've always got the thing, we you vegans have got to do everything, right? And I, I invited uh, Bernie, Bernie Wright from, from Ireland on today, but I think she's forgotten about it. Um, but she always says that the welfare is so shit that the vegans have got to do it. So I don't know whether that's the position that you're taking. My position is let the welfareists do the welfare because that's their position. Whereas if we, if we do welfare, we're not actually telling the truth. It's not what we want. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the other thing I think that it's, you know, just the, just the point is that I don't, I don't believe we're ever going to get a vegan society. Um, I know people might think, well, that's weird. But the, the reason for that is because veganism is a philosophy. It's not a diet. And to get a vegan society, you'd have to have every single human believing in that philosophy. And that isn't going to happen. But what you could get is what I call an animal liberationist society, where there are enough people believing in the vegan philosophy that what we say goes. And that's what we need to aim for. We're not going to get everyone go vegan, but we don't need to. We just need to be the ones that call the shots. And then we get an animal liberation society because people won't be allowed to oppress other animals. Hmm. <sighs> Support for your position there, I think. Yes, I definitely see it as Dan expresses the reality. Everything that can be done, but demanding the radical foundational rights abolitionist philosophy. And so this again, I mean, to, to bring up the specter of uh, Gary Francione, he's always says that he's opposed to single issues. He's actually not because he believes the single issues can be abolitionized. It's just that he thinks that he's really the only person who will do it properly. So he argues against it because he thinks everybody else wouldn't do it very well. Hi, Louise. And um, that's that's where the tea came from. That was Louise's mum. <laughs> oh, look. And, um, oh, you know, I and, see Ronnie's welfare is okay there. Ronnie's living in a very high welfare house there, getting well, well looked as as after. Got, as long as I've got my cup of tea, I'm all right. Yeah, I've got to make my own me, mate. <laughs> Bloody hell. Well, we could have a petition. We, we want we want all factory farm animals to have a cup of tea at three o'clock in the afternoon. You see, this is another point I wanted to bring up, but I forgot. And it's it's like the exposure. I mean, if if we went to farms and we went to the perfect farm where they clear the shit up every day, they they jet wash the walls down, they you know they they they, they wash the wash the cows and. They put fresh straw down, and we went and exposed that. People would not think there was anything wrong. They would not see, you know. So when when I'm out advocating for for veganism and and for animal rights, and I've got all this video of these cows in the field in summertime, um, it's not 
it's not getting through to people and yeah well, you see what you're saying there danny is that we're not good at presenting the case for our rights yeah i could i could yeah i mean it, it's a hard one because it's a very hard one to bring the case of animal rights to to a society that is 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 entrenched in in this behavior that 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 the, it's been pretty much normalized a normal part of life so you've well, got to well this is the ripening up thing that that wasn't talked about it, it goes back also to social movement theory because there's this thing about how how do some social movements operate and this this applies to us it's through moral shocks so we we want to moral yeah. shock people right and i've, I've got a book called the Am rights um crusade in there and the front cover is somebody holding up a banner and it says look and it's got a picture of a fur bearing creature in a trap and the and the thing is um need i say more right now if somebody went up to that person and said well actually i think you need to say more what's wrong with that the person is liable to say well look see yeah but i want you to explain what's wrong with that they said, well, look, which essentially is what happens at a cube. You're pointing at the screen. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, look, look at that. And they go, OK, well, convince me in terms of the case around the rights that that is wrong. It's that there's a moral there's a moral something going on there rather than we both agree that that's cruel because that's what everybody does when they look at those screens. And there's the question of the activists then, as I said in the first video, the activists see a direct line between animal cruelty and veganism, which doesn't exist in society. It just doesn't exist. What exists in society is what was in that petition, which is, oh, there's animal cruelty. That ought to be cleaned up and better regulated and monitored. That's what, that's what the public think. They don't think, oh, therefore must go vegan. That's that's what the activists assume as some kind of direct dots between animal cruelty and veganism, which which culturally isn't there, Danny. But also it misses out on what the main problem is. You know, the main problem isn't that on some farms, um, you know, cows are being kicked and 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 cruelly treated. The main problem is that these animals. Um, are being reared in the first place and then sent for slaughter. You know, that's the main problem. That's the overriding, massively huge problem. I mean, we had a, a similar thing, like, the, you know, for quite some years, like Louise and I ran a campaign against the greyhound racing industry. And the League Against Cruel Sports got involved. And they, um, uh, you know, there, there are dogs actually, you know, killed on the tracks. Um, and they they kind of had this campaign to make the tracks safer and to kind of improve the rehoming of dogs right but the main problem with the main problem with the greyhound racing industry wasn't that the main problem with the greyhound racing industry is that half the dogs that are bred for greyhound racing are killed because they're not suitable that's the that's the major problem and then also it, it, even if, if even if dogs at the end of the day um get found homes or get put into rescues they're just taking the place of other dogs that will will get to, you know put down in their place because there's this huge surplus of dogs that um you know haven't got homes to go to now that's the problem you see and and that they were dealing with relatively my, minor issues but the the danger was and why, why we really hated their campaign was the danger Oh. oh well you know if, if 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 they can tidy up you know make the tracks a bit safer and improve the you know the home of these dogs and everything's okay and i can continue betting on greyhounds and i can continue going to the tracks and that's the danger with that kind of welfareist approach is it can actually you know uh impede uh abolition um and thank th thankfully the league against cross sports is now totally opposed to the greyhound racing industry they've come around to that point of view now but they didn't used to be. And that's just a kind of, you know, sort of microcosm of, I think, kind of what we're faced with with this, you know, the kind of, you know, the risks of people thinking, well, if these things are, are kind of dealt with, then I can carry on 
quite happily consuming animal products. But I mean, the thing is about farming, though, is is the way we farm. I mean, cows don't sit, stand in a field for twelve months a year, especially in the UK. They they they're lucky if they see three months. Um, but because the way we farm animals for profit. The, the cruelty goes hand in hand, the castration of the pigs without anaesthetic, the docking of the, the tails, um, the, the fly strike um, um, treatments for, for lambs, ripping the tails off, putting elastic bands off, dehorning. This all comes because we need to make a profit. We need to get as many animals on the smallest amount of land possible. And so there's an inherent cruelty, full stop, with with animal farming anyway and that i find is is the way in with people that is what i try and express to people is that and there's there's no way they'll be able to stop that because even if they come back to me roger and say well we'll stop doing that well you can't not castrate a pig you can't not dehorn because otherwise then the injuries happen you know uh, we have problems with with the pigs and you know and they can't Keep, not to keep pigs in sow stalls when when they when they have a litter of babies. You, you can't. There's no other way of doing this, you know. So it's like I don't know what you're trying to say, though, Danny. There, I don't know what I'm trying to say, Roger. You know me. It's just like <laughs> I've got a million thoughts going through my head. This is this is. Listen, folks. This is why I re, I'm reading this book. Right, um, is that I suffer suffer with the problem? I suspect. So um, yeah, I'm a bit er erratic with my thoughts, and I look at comments and. Uh, sometimes I agree with Roger and Ronnie. Sometimes I disagree, and yeah, but yeah, Roger knows how to bear with me anyway, so it's all right. Don't worry about it. But yeah, I, 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 I was going to say. I think another thing that is important to to look at is it's kind of great having all this kind of evidence of what happens on farms. Um, I think it's crucial. But, but how do we? But that, nevertheless still needs to be got to the public and okay there was something on um something there on panorama it didn't really um not that i watched it from but from what i've heard it didn't really properly get out the message we'd have wanted people to hear about the dairy industry but nevertheless it was better that it was on there than it wasn't right so you know that's a a, a positive thing in itself but the main problem we have throughout the vegan movement is we have it a lack of people, a huge lack of activism, a huge lack of, of vegans getting out there and actually educating people about why it's wrong that animals should be oppressed in the way they are or oppressed at all, of course, and that the answer to it is, is to go vegan. And, and this, this, this is the, the major problem that we face with the mm. overriding problem, I'd say, is this lack of yeah, yeah. doing outreach and lack of people organising outreach? Because the most important thing, in a way, are the organisers and the instigators. Because unless someone organises something, then if there was happen. if there was more vegan activists, we could actually correct some of the problems. Because we, we've yeah. all agreed, I think, that it's essential to have this footage. It's a question of the claims making that goes along with it, and and the demands that go along with it. The demands from the group that produce this this thing is for the government to step in and regulate things better and that therefore will in their terms protect animals now we would probably think that's very unlikely that any system of regulation of, of breeding into into existence fattening transporting and slaughtering is going to protect animals in fact by definition it doesn't because it kills them okay so 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 is that and so we could change the, the the claims making especially when we're dealing with things like journalists and stuff the the problem for me is the fact that i think a lot of vegans will connive with the claims making and not criticize it and they wouldn't say well this is you know we're not going to sign that petition why why would we but i mean if you, if you say look at this terrible expose in wells go vegan we'll sign that one mm. What, what about this thing, scrap in... factory farming? You're, you're, both in, you're both in Britain, so what's that about, you know? 
Scrap factory farming UK legal uh, I think challenge. The, the problem is straight away is scrap factory farming. Does that mean that scrapping uh, intensive farming? Does that mean that extensive farming is okay if it's not? Uh, uh, you know, uh, animals kept in fields. Is that is that okay? And then well, they say, they say no to that, but they'd say well, mo most of the animals are kept in factory farms, and the factory farms are worse. And so we're, we're always on the lookout what? for the worst. Uh, uh, yes, but the, the thing is, though, kind of in in in, in one way they're worse. Um, depends how you look at it. I mean, look at it from an animal welfare where point of view. Yes. Um, but um, in terms of something like, you know, like there's a, a lot these days about, you know, eat the vegan diet to save the planet because of the climate crisis. We need to, um, you know, massively reduce. Um, this is what uh, <laughs> this is what the environmentalists say. They said, you know, my view is we should need to totally end the consumption of animal products but they're saying we need to you know hugely reduce the consumption of animal products um in order to combat the climate crisis and interestingly enough in in fact you know that there are a lot of environmentalists such as george monbiot for instance the well-known environmentalist who who actually promotes a vegan diet you know to combat the climate crisis uh although he's supposed to factory farming for welfare reasons he actually says that in terms of the the climate extensive farming is actually worse than intensive farming because it uses more land and uh, if animals weren't grazed on that land that could become be re rewilded go back to woodland and it could pull all this uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and again but still not the fundamental wrong running sorry and again not still not the fundamental wrong from our still point of view still not the fundamental wrong no of course not Still not the fundamental wrong. So, so I mean, it, it, it interests me that we've got an entire movement that has existed for many decades. And the main thing we don't talk about is the main thing that we say to ourselves and each other that is the fundamental wrong. And so rather than that, we then try to get all political about it and act like a politician and say, well, perhaps we would not, not say, let, let, let's say this you know, and all, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, so so let's, you know, I mean, I've lost count of the number of people who say, well, it is right to talk about cruelty because um, the public know what you mean by cruelty. And of course, we can all say, well, yeah, that's true. I mean, or at least we think that's true. Uh, and, and that's an interesting one because I think when most people hear the phrase animal cruelty, they think of people kicking dogs and they think of hitting them with sticks and, the, and they think think of the kind of thing that some of the big groups put out, you know, the slamming against the, the walls and this kind of stuff. And their immediate thought is, not go vegan, of course, is that, no, that should stop because I'm against cruelty. Everyone is against cruelty. So that's the position we start with. And then we think that we can we can move them towards veganism because they're against cruelty yeah i mean that that does work yeah it works with some yeah but it's not the fundamental problem no i no agreed agreed i think i think we're all in agreement that it's not the fundamental problem i think but we never say great. it danny we never say it our movement never says it i've started saying it in conversations hmm. but it's it's further down the conversation it's further down the conversation. It, it's more, and and the cruelty thing is like yes, people don't inherently don't don't agree with cruelty, and a lot of people are surprised when you point out that their choice is involved. So, involve so cruelty. they would bring it, they would bring it up, wouldn't they? So if you if you're at your we the free thing and you've got a screen there, and you go, uh, look at this, uh, madam, uh, this is animal use. We we think this is a violation of fundamental rights, and they go, oh yes, it's very cruel, isn't it? Then they're going to bring cruelty up. You don't have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you can then have a conversation. But what what we do in Dublin is we have a conversation which accepts the fact that they're going to talk about cruelty because that's what they know. But you steer them to the fundamental all the time. So again, it's, you know, rather than getting involved with the welfare paradigm, you're forever contextualizing it. 
by saying, well, yeah, but of course, from our point of view, that's not the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue is this. And then you can go back to cruelty and say, well, you know, you've just said this, that and the other. But, you know, that's not our fundamental position. However, you know, you can you can have a chat with them about it by keeping reinforcing the fact that we've got a fundamental position and this is it. And that's the only way that they're going to ever know it. And, and the frustrating thing from my point of view is that animal rights as an idea has never had um, the exposure, certainly in this country and in, in Britain, for it to be tested. We all make assumptions that, oh, it's a bit too much, it's a bit too abstract, it's a bit too academic and this kind of stuff. But we've never been able to test it because it gets drowned out by the welfare all the time. Um, just to clarify, the these hashtag scrap factory farming, if you put that mm. in Twitter, it brings up animal aid. Uh, a legal team. Um, we're standing in solidarity with a brilliant team at, at Scrap Factory Farm who are in court today with DEFRA in the docks. Farmed animals are some of the most abused on earth. You can support them by donating directly to this thing, blah, blah, blah. Peter Regan's part of it scrap factory farming so yeah it's it's something linked to animal aid and animal justice project have got the hashtag in there yeah animal justice project have, have got it in their their twitter feed as well we, we we had we had the justice project on the animal rights show and we were at we were asking Ayrton about how how do you maintain the fact that they're, cl they're claiming to be animal rights abolitionists and everything that they're not they're not involved with animal welfare and that's not their position and then recently they've got a petition out to to get a duck farm prosecuted and so they it's very easy to get suckered in to animal welfare all the time and to to maintain a kind of distance from that it is is not easy when the rest of the movement are doing it and expecting you to be involved and critiquing you if you're not and i i just think well look you know wouldn't it be good if at least some people let's let's make up a name for them animal rights advocates who believe in animal rights if they were the ones who were putting out the animal rights case then that means that people could assess it and think, oh, that's an interesting idea. I'll I'll go with that because the R Ronnie's position is he wants the focus to be on veganism. Now, animal rights has got a much more direct line to veganism than the stuff that we generally do. That panorama thing doesn't particularly, but also what animal equality have done with it afterwards. There's no direct line to veganism, and in fact, they even don't mention veganism they're scared of it so we need people who are not scared of veganism to make the case yeah but i mean in the past but veganism is is still got a bit of is still a bit tainted as well it's still got negative connotations it's still got this this sort of view that a vegan is some screamy shouty person who who storms into mcdonald's or or shouts in the street or you know it's there is a negative connotation to saying the word vegan, but that is dissipating now because, as you said, veganism is appearing on TV. Look at the reaction to that. Did you see the vegan TV ad? Uh, the um, where they order Vigo. a pig. Yeah, they Vigo, order the. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean th that is 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 had a massive impact. And as you say, in the supermarkets now, there's vegan aisles. There's vegan everywhere. There's a lot of vegan shampoos. There's the vegan word is becoming more and more normalized now, and that's yeah, what we how want come... is, is to normalize it. But yeah, in answer the past, me this, it... answer me this though, Danny. If how I can. come the super how come the supermarkets are less scared than veganism than animal equality is? Box, it's money, isn't it? They can sell crap food for more money to stupid people like me well, who I go out and buy it. To... It's not veganism they're promoting, it's vegan food and that's exactly yeah. veganism. Yeah, you um, are gonna that that they know that there are a lot of vegans um out here and they want but that's a money. separate argument at least they're uh, at least they're, they're prepared they're, to they're, use they're the, the word, word. Yeah, they're, use, they're using the word the fact that they're using the words, won't. yeah and the quality won't yeah you know how does that work
you've Zem got... says because the supermarkets don't know what veganism is, they think it has something to do with food. But yes, yeah, so does does like eighty percent of the population, non vegan population of, of the of the UK thinks well, sadly, veganism quite a lot is of a the diet. Non active vegans w- would say that too. But um, I mean that that's a that's a separate issue. But at least mm. at least they're not frightened of the word. And on the call, you're frightened of the word. And that I mean that is bizarre. In in the twenty first century. I mean, well, look we... at look at look back in the day. Look at um, look at um, that pop star um, George Michael, um, Elton John, right in the seventies. It was wasn't in his interest to say he was gay, because it would have a negative effect on his career. And attaching something to vegan a, a few years back would have negative connotations, but. But like I said, now that is coming into the forefront, that the vegan word is, isn't doesn't sound as a as a it hasn't got the same connotations anymore. It, it it's it doesn't it's give a question that, of ripening it's up. It's becoming normal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But that's a process, Danny, and and we're supposed to be at the forefront of that process. Donald Watson called it ripening up. The people have to be ripened up to a new idea. They're not just going to come come across it um, by magic. We're going to have to talk about it, and once they stop falling off their chair and, and laughing, then then they'll they'll assess it, which is exactly what they d- did with the phrase "animal liberation," which is exactly why Peter Singer starts the book with an apology. Oh, you know, I'm sure that you're thinking that animal liberation is a parody of human liberation, but it's not, right? Because at the time. The, the notion of animal liberation was kind of laughable in those days. We were talking about 1975. Now, you can say that phrase and nobody no, nobody cares. You can say vegan now and people have a general idea of what you're talking about. Um, I mean, Whereas, it's great because I would have been vegan a long time ago had I come into contact with vegans. I don't know how the hell you two got into what you got into in the 70s. I've never, I'd never heard of veganism until... Five years ago, I'd never heard of it. I'd come across two vegans and I just thought, what a weird diet, you know? So I think it's great that veganism is everywhere. And it, and yes, it's linked to a diet. And yes, people think it's a diet. But once they go down that route, they they then start seeing the truth. They, they get Because why would you tap in anything on a search and put vegan in that search? You wouldn't. There's no reason to. There's no reason to whatsoever to put vegan in any search unless you, you, you in your head, are on a vegan diet. Oh, I'm, on, I'm taking up a vegan diet now. It's all about food. Tap in vegan chicken well, you've heard nuggets. The word. You've heard the word. You tap in vegan chicken nuggets. Not only will vegan chicken nuggets come up, vegan YouTubers, vegan films, vegan. Lots of other stuff comes into contact with you then. So and if you're not in about contact. It, it's um I, I mean i i i get what you you mean and of, of course we all, we all know that um in fact there is some research to suggest that it doesn't really matter how people come into the movement because they can be exposed then to the ethical arguments so the actual entry point is not the problem but if they don't um encounter the ethical arguments and fairly early on that's a that's a problem be, because they've they've got they've got to move from the fact of oh blimey I thought we were talking about a diet here and now I I find out this is this wonderful philosophy which is a, about justice and peace and everything that's that's great right and so if you can bring them into that wider realm of you know the vision of of veganism that, well obviously that's great and it doesn't matter how they started that's what I always say that's what I always say yeah. I, I, I can well, lie to people media. since I've been vegan. I can jump over houses. I'm, I'm one of the fastest men alive to do a do do like I can do a two minute mile since I've been vegan. You know, it doesn't matter. You just but, lie to them. <laughs> yeah, lie to them. I don't care. But but the point is, is is you need to. You know, people need to. There's a what we don't realize is how many people are not exposed. To, to veganism, even though it has been on TV ads, even yeah. if, if this TV show, it, it's surprising how many people have never even heard of the word vegan, let alone meet one. That's the importance. Of the oh, oh, the this, this, this is where, Ronnie's co- this is where Ronnie comes in, because that's why he wants yeah. more veganism out on the streets. Yeah, yeah. Ronnie, yeah. sorry, you, you froze Absolutely. them, mate. Can you start again? 
what I did. Yeah, you froze for a minute. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, oh did I? <laughs> yes, I mean, I mean, absolutely. That there's, um, we have um, a much greater number of um, vegans now than we had, say, in the 1970s. But in the 1970s, if somebody was a vegan, 70s or 1980s, um, there was a very strong chance that they'd also be an activist. Right? They might not have been an activist um, promoting veganism. Which was like or a, a punk, a, a huge, a huge error. I think we made in those days was that we didn't promote veganism and promoted all these kind of single issues instead. Um, but nevertheless, those people w were highly likely to be activists. These days, it's not the case. It's the other way around. That you ask a vegan, are they are they an activist? The chances probably ninety percent of them at least um, won't be. And they think that's you know that's that's a, this, we've got this huge potential. For spreading the vegan message that's that's unrealized because people aren't active and people don't have to go you know breaking into places or, or doing anything shouty or anything like that to be active i mean just spreading information you know distributing leaflets or helping out to the uh, an information stall or, or or something like that you know the, the really simple things that people can do that uh, um that virtually anyone could do who's a vegan I think yeah, there's and, a, lot, and that's a lot of kind people of doing that, though, Ronnie. And as I said before, you know, we need for those things to happen. We need people to organise those things, and so so that's where where you know that's kind of the the most important thing. I I think if if we're going to do you know progress the movement, if we're ever going to achieve animal liberation, we have to have more activists and we have to have more organisers. And this is so why what, I love AV. This is why I love love pig saves, uh, um, vigils. That's right. We need, we need, it, the activists have got to be grassroots, and the activists yeah. have almost got to be a bit more critical in, in their thinking in terms of self actuation. You know, um, there 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 is a there is a kind of um, a weird kind of situation now where you've got a lot of activists, but they're waiting around to be told what to do. Mm. which kind of wasn't really what used to go on. People used to go, oh, here's a problem. And then they would come up with some kind of solution themselves and, and, and go to, go for it, which I suppose is why you ended up with all the different things, you know, the ALF and the NAL, uh, you know, inspections and all, all, the rest of, all the rest of it. Because people would just go, right, I'm an activist. Let's do something. But they, they're not, they weren't looking for a kind of model of activism. And I think I think that's a bit of a difference. It, it wouldn't matter though, so long as, you know. I mean, like it seems to me that once a cube gets big enough, it should split in two. And then once those two get big enough, they should split in two and and spread spread out. You know, I mean, that, like, um, I mean, I mean, the group that I I work alongside with in in, in Ireland is called Vigo Vegan Education on the Go because Declan always wanted to spread vegan activism all around Ireland. Mm not just in the cities and particularly not just in Dublin where most of it happens, of course, in the same sense as a heck of a lot used to happen in London. But then the, the, the other big cities used to be, and, and your, your vision, Ronnie, is for that to spread out again into the suburbs yeah. and into the villages and the towns. Yeah, because what's happening is people aren't doing, a lot of people aren't doing the the, the big, in education, they live. You know, they're going into the middle of a city to join other people and to do some kind of spectacular event, which is kind of it's fair enough. And, and I'd rather see those things happening than them not happen. But I think people need to think about what can I do where I live? What can I do in a little town where I live where nothing happens? You know, even if it's just doing a street stall or doing a stall at an event or putting mm. leaflets through people's letterboxes. I mean, you know, I mean, Salem Bennett, say, say, sorry to interrupt, Ronnie, because uh, mm. I'm going to have to shoot in a minute. I'm I'm going to have to get my layers on and I'm going out into the wilderness, creeping around farms in <laughs> in about an hour. But um, yeah, some Salem, Salem Bennett one? says, not a huge fan of saves unless it actually motivates someone into doing other activism. But the thing is about safe movements is, is like, for instance, a lot of lot of the slaughterhouses are hidden away or in in neighbourhoods where people didn't didn't even know that they existed. And then when you get a regular set of people out there doing vigils and 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 the safe movement, 
it, it, it brings it home to people like, oh, this is actually a slaughterhouse, you know? Just like people didn't realise the concentration camps were, were in the neighbourhood, in Poland and Germany. It's like, it, 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 again, it's another little little sort of, of nail in the coffin for, for the animal agricultural industry, that these little little sort of beautiful outside slaughterhouses that are dotted in these beautiful locations are hidden away and people are, are, are just unaware that they exist. And I think the SAVE movement, every sort of activism is great activism. And I think the SAVE movement does that. It highlights the one I go to, um, it, you wouldn't know what it did. You wouldn't know from looking at it, like it's manicured bushes and it's topiary and it's beautiful drives and, you know, the, 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 the painted fences. It, you wouldn't know what went on in there unless people are outside with banners saying, this is a slaughterhouse, this is a gas chamber, you know? So I think it's very useful. So, yeah. And, 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 what, and what, what is the product of that, Danny? It's ex well, it's the product of what we do. Well, for the animals, it, it's giving the animals the only bit of compassion and the only bit of compassionate human interaction that they'll, they'll have in the short lives. It, it's, it's acknowledging that these animals existed rather than be anonymous um, beings going to the, from the farm to the slaughter. They're not anonymous anymore, you know? We, we take photographs of them, we put them on Facebook, we put them everywhere and say, look, these are the victims of your choices. You, so, so yeah, that, that's the, for the animals and, and for the rest of it. It's about exposing these slaughterhouses and holding them accountable and saying, look, this is what you're yeah. doing here. You know, well, I've, 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 done, I've done saves myself. There's, there's um, a slaughterhouse just outside um, Dublin called Key Pack, and we've, we've, we've done that a few times. But, um, I mean, I remember when saves started. I remember there was a lot of, there was a lot of comment about the fact that it's misnamed in a, in a sense because it doesn't save anyone but that's that's just a niggle i think but also i'm not i'm not quite sure that it needs to be done that regularly because you always get the same footage over over and over again so, now the other bit the other bit though so where what? you say so so what well you do, well you don't you don't need you get it a different, you get you get a different individual yeah, I agree, I agree with that, and and that's that's the, the the bit that I'm I'm intrigued by by the safe thing is that thing about because I I don't like the idea of bearing witness, but I do like the idea that you're actually I don't know giving another being an experience of somebody acknowledgement, who's not, yeah, yeah, acknowledgement. And, and and also they're going to have an interaction with a human which is not exploitative for yeah. the only time in their entire in life. life, yeah. Six so months. I, so I, I, I can see I can see that. You know, so I'm not I'm not arguing against it. Um, I I just point out that I don't I don't think in terms of the product that comes from it, which which are the pictures, and we've used them on on the stall. Um, is, I don't think you need to be there every week. Well, we're not there every week. It's once every every mm. fortnight, I think. And and the point is, Roger, like I said before. The, there's a hell of a lot of people unaware and there's a hell of a lot of people out there. Someone might be, like we said before, on the vegan diet and they might be tapping in vegan on Facebook, looking for some ideas about veganism on Facebook and all of a sudden, bang, save movement. The newest post has just come up. So those people haven't been exposed to those pictures. So it doesn't matter whether it's the similar footage time after time after time, when that pops up, if that pops up in front of somebody who's never been exposed to it and didn't know, then that's it. You've, you've got them in. You've got them in in the first sort of, like, exposure to, to what's really happening. And yeah. I think it's crucial. I don't... Yeah. The minute we start saying, oh, it's just... I mean, look at everything we do is repetitive because what, the, what I, the industry what, what is repetitive. I, what I'd say is, I mean, I can see some value in it. You know, what, what I want to know is it know how effective is it is it at educating people to go vegan you know that's my that that's that would be you know my number one question about it and i think it does have there's no doubt that it has some effect but i think if you want to educate people you've got to go to where the people are yeah i agree you see well, and, and the saves are going to where the animals are going in to be killed um whereas um, I often wonder, would it be more effective to go to where the people are, 
to a town centre to an event with, attended by lots of people or even putting letters through people's letterboxes. Oh, both. Uh, you know, the whole families have access to them. Um, is, is, is that a more effective way of getting the message to people is to go to where the people you, are rather you, than, you, than to where the animals are? Do you know what we did in June last year, Ronnie, outside Tulip? We, we had a pop concert. We had Morbius Luke play there. And then um, Diwali, we had a Diwali ceremony there with Harry Krishnas. Uh, we had a big, big event there with dancing and free food and passers-by came and neighbours came. Uh, we're going to do another one on the summer solstice. We're going to get, try and make it even bigger um, and get Morbius Loop and a few other bands to play there outside the gates. You know, so and we're trying to bring in different groups in Manchester. We're trying to bring in in women's rights groups. We're trying to bring in religious groups. We're trying to we, we had um, the guy, the leader of the um, vegetarian society in Manchester who's vegan. We had the him him to save uh, last Tuesday, so we we we're we're, we're, we're up in it now. We're changing the, the the game, and we're bringing people into these this group of compassionate people who stand there, rain, sleet, or snow, you know. And we are educating those people, and those people are coming who wouldn't normally come, and and they're seeing it for themselves. This they're looking into those near human eyes of those pigs, and making a connection because that is powerful. When you look into the eyes of an animal that's about to be put in a gas chamber, hung upside down and stabbed in the throat, and you look into their eyes with that in your mind, that's an amazing sort of connection that you have with that animal. It's an amazing. Well, well, here's two comments that you could address, because it's exactly on that point you just made. There's two. There's two. First of all, um, it, both of them by Zem. Uh, I think a lot of activists burn out due to attending uh, saves. I don't know. I don't have any evidence of that. Did, what, what do you think? Um... I, I'd say it, it's very emotional, um, but you do you do get used to it, which is a sad side effect of it. Um, I can imagine people who aren't who are very. I mean, I'm hardened. I'm I'm hardened to it, and I'm sure. I mean, Ronnie, you're you're not. You couldn't watch that that no, panorama I would, I, I would show. Go, I would However, go, I could. I would go for a save. Myself. I'm very good at I'm very good yeah. at compen my, compen my, you know and and mm. and like just I'm I'm very good at sort of putting things away. So Zem, yes, I think sooner or later everything's going to pop into my mind and, and I'm going to explode maybe. But until that point happens, I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. Um, but it, it is a very emotional thing to do, and I always urge everybody who can attend one attend one because. When you've looked into their eyes and seen their position, when you then in turn talk to people, they can. When you visualise that in your mind, when you're talking to people, people can see that you've seen this with your own eyes, and it it, it always passes on. It's very powerful to talk to people having witnessed this for yourself, you know. And yeah, it, it is. It's. It, I think it's essential that many people do yeah, it. And it, it does Lin make the Linda maximum. said she likes this. Uh, I think bearing witness is so important. I mean, I, I don't actually like the phrase, but I, I, understand, I understand what it means but behind it. The other thing that... You Zem don't like said, anything you, Roger. You don't like I anything. Do. I do. Like, I like loads of things. Um, <laughs> the, this, this idea did pop into my head, and then Zem typed it. So, um, dancing outside a slaughterhouse. I no mean, you were, talk, were... you were talking about being respectful to the... Plant. Right, so, okay, okay. So, Diwali is a festival of light, and it's it's all about bringing light into darkness and positive, positivity into negativity. That's what, what Diwali is all about. Um, and it brought a lot of people in out of curiosity. Um, and who says we aren't taken seriously? Who says that? Who's Who are you speaking for, Zem? You know, um, I don't know who you're speaking on behalf of, but... But having a concert outside something positive, outside something so full of negative energy, is is a really nice thing to do, and it, it does create a buzz, and it does create a spectacle that brings people over to question what we're doing, and especially when you put it online as well. You know, it's all about drawing people in. We've got to draw people in. People are, are blinkered up and they walk past. They, they don't want to confront what's in front of them. Right. Otherwise, the whole planet would be vegan now if, if everybody took the blinkers off. So we need ways of bringing people in to have that conversation. So, yeah, um, I, I don't agree with that comment, Zem. I don't think people 
don't take us seriously. The only people who don't take us seriously are the people who are shuttered up and don't want to change because they just really do not care where the food, clothes, chemicals, shampoos come from. They don't care. That's it. You know, we're never going to change those people. The thing is, Danny, that, that's in, in one part of Manchester, isn't it? Yes. Now, Manchester's a big city. Yes. It's got lots of suburbs. Yes. What's happening in all those suburbs? Those suburbs have got little shopping areas. They've got streets of houses. Who's doing outreach in those suburbs? Not a lot, Ronnie. Not a lot. We've got an AV in central need, Manchester. That's, yes. That, that's what we need. We need it everywhere. Uh, that's great for people that are happen to be going past the slaughterhouse or people that come Yeah, but Ronnie, that means you can go to the slaughterhouse, get your footage and then take it to the suburbs, surely. That's... Yes, 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 of course. But but that's what I mean. That that's, that's fine. And to say to people, look, this is going on only a few miles from here. You know, and you, th yeah, that's that, that's great, but uh, it, it kind of needs to be taken there, and and needs to be people to people to take. Yeah, it I agree totally, mate. Probably, probably a lot of those people that go to, um, you know, the the, the slaughterhouse vigils live in those suburbs, and this is what I'm saying. You know, for to people to think about, you know, where you live, how you can educate the community around you, how you can kind of in install at the the local community event in the local park or something you know that kind of that's the level we need to be at if we're going to be really grassroots and get everywhere you know zem says i can't imagine a concert outside of auschwitz right but yet outside auschwitz they had a, a band to play music as the as the people were brought in you know yeah, but that was organized by the nazis though exactly it was organized by the nazis but um it's funny that Tulip allowed us to do that as well. But yeah, um, yeah, it's not the same thing, is it? It's, it's um, it, having an event outside somewhere to draw attention to it is completely different than than having a party. It's not as if like we 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 went into a, into a cemetery and and had a big dancing party amongst the gravestones. It, it's it's not about that. It's a, it's about it's about creating a buzz and 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 a spectacle to get people to look. Otherwise, you're just showing s some empty gates that tell you nothing of what goes on in there. Whereas with this, people are walking past, or we put it on on social media, and people say, "Well, what the hell was going on there?" And then we can explain that that you know this this place gases individuals and then and then kills them and chops them into pieces for food, you know. But listen, mm -hmm. um, Roger, I'm going to have to go, mate. Um, yeah. I'm going to have to start making moves. But um, okay, thank you. Danny, well, th thanks for coming on. Thank you and, for um, having me. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody's comments out there and, and who's come on to, to interact and everything. It's just a shame nobody jumped on to <laughs> have a chat with you, really. It's just one of them things, you know. It, it's, we're, it's too, we're, big, too, we're too old and scary, us three. Yes. <laughs> speak, for, yeah. speak for yourself. But listen, thank you for having me on. It's great to talk to you again, Ronnie. It's great to talk to you, Roger. Um, yeah, we must do it again, mate. You take care, yeah? And yeah. Um, have a good evening. I and will. We won't, ask any, we won't ask any questions about it. Oh, it'll all be on, on footage in the next few days, whatever we oh, find, whether it be good or bad. So that's what I'm going to do. Whether it's good or bad, I am going to expose it. Well, you are a fast worker, so we'll we'll, we'll look for your YouTube channel. Listen, everybody. Peace. Take care, Danny. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. Now, this is a nuanced position, as ever, from uh, Wendy, because um, it's interesting... Uh, the same mechanism that allows activists to desensitize to atrocities is the same that allows non-vegans to normalize violations and violence. And of course, there, 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 is, there is that. I mean, there are, there are some activists that do what we don't do, Ronnie, which is, I mean, I know a couple of people who almost religiously kind of watch Earthlings, you know, once a month, because they almost like think it's their duty to do it. And and I I I don't I don't quite buy that. Um, I, I but then no again, purpose. we use. I see no purpose in it, and all it's going to do is, is 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 cause you know mental harm to those people. Surely, I, I just don't understand it at all. There's no way I'd watch Earthlings, or any of those things. I don't need to. I'm, I'm vegan. You know why would I need to constantly bombard myself with? Stuff I kind of know already, or I don't might not know the details of things that are happening in those things, but I know. But it's the details are... that they want to pass on to the public, right? Well, the, the, 
we already have the information to pass on to the public, which is that you know, the, these animals are being, you know, reared and they're being sent for slaughter. And that's wrong because we don't need to do it. We can be, you know, that's all we kind of really need to pass on to the public. And the fact that this often happens at, you know, a, a tiny fraction of the animal's natural life. That's the, reason, that's the kind of reason for being vegan, isn't it? You know, that's, you know, like kind of all this other stuff is like additional information that we kind of, and, and there's plenty of stuff yeah, but that's got again, that information. I mean, like I, I remember um, I remember reading Victims of Science that you, you mentioned in your recent interview, and I remember um, yeah. reading Slaughter of the Innocent by Hans Royce in order to know the details and the arguments, yeah? Well, the, yeah, but the arguments, you know, the, the, the arguments against animal experimentation are kind of really quite simple. And and you kind of don't need to know the details of experiments to be able to 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 argue the moral position. No, no, it, 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 it's interesting, you see, this is the distinction between the case for animal rights by Reagan and animal liberation by Singer. In, in animal liberation, there's a lot of description of factory farms, of section and this kind of stuff, whereas in Reagan, there's a lot of arguments about why that's a rights violation. And the movement went with the description because they wanted to shock people, whereas the case presents the argument about why those things are wrong. And yeah. from a welfare point of view, you don't need an argument. You almost like think, again, it's back to the, well, look, look how bad it is. You don't need an argument. You just need to show people. And that is the basis of a lot of animal activism, that you show people, you shock them, and you don't have to make a case because you've, you've proven your point by just showing them the problem. I, I think you can show them the you can show them stuff to, to attract their attention, but then you have to give them the moral argument having attracted their attention. No, but that's what I was getting at before, Ronnie. Yes, I, I think yeah. a lot of activists just point back to the screen and say, "Well, look." Mm. You know. Yeah. Um, are you okay to stay for another ten minutes? Yes. Yes. Certainly. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well. I, I just, I just want to go through this little document here, which is only about five slides, I think. So this is, um, again, the kind of job that we were doing, which was to try to say, okay, well, we had the, the panorama thing, and then we had the re reaction to it. And then my question to this as abolitionists is, is what can we do with this? The first thing, which is the actual footage, and now in terms of the reaction, because, of course, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with welfare right across the board. So this is the Grocery Gazette. And um, so it, it's talking about uh, cruelty, of course. Um, the, the, these are, uh, are things. And then you've got the other elements to it that Danny mentioned, the fact that the farmer's and the and the farming representative said that we're saddened by it all. Shouldn't have happened. They should be. Um, we need to clean it up. So we need to, in, in, you know, increase the regulation because, from the farming point of view, they they in a sense have got to. They've they've got a difficult thing because they've got to, make the case for animal welfare because they can't answer the animal rights point. Unless they just want to argue that other animals don't 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 have rights, and and so they've got they've got a, di a difficult job on their hands, and and that's why I think in some ways we kind of let them off the hook by us joining in with the animal welfare stuff. Mm. I think we should we should never do that. The, no, the, I, mean, I, I I I agree, and and it's the thing is how 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 do we respond? I mean, like if there's somewhere, for instance, if something like this. Uh, if there was a story about this in my local paper, then I'd get a letter to into the paper or I'd get someone else to write a letter to the paper, you know, uh, putting forward the vegan position on it, you see. Um, uh, but with an article like that, I don't suppose there's any sort of direct response kind of to that in a sense. I, th I think what this may do is is this, if, if someone's kind of doing a vegan stall, it may cause more people perhaps to come to the stall and say, oh, I saw that 
program on the television mm. and that may be it may be that people might come up to a stall that otherwise may not come up to the stall if they saw that uh, you were maybe promoting for instance on on the stalls that you do where you're giving away the vegan cheese and stuff like that you know it may <laughs> a, attract additional people to that because they somehow connect it and then you can have a discussion with them so it may it may be useful in that way well I, ironically we, we were doing a stall in liverpool when the um when the mars bar hoax broke we got loads of people coming up uh to ask questions about it but also you know say you haven't got any mars bars have you made in this kind of stuff you know because they were they were taken off the shelves so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so it's almost like any anything can create uh, the issue in a sense. Yes. But yeah. Yeah. Let's have let's have a look at the, this these two little bits because I want I want to kind of I'm not going to go through this bit, but there's just these two little sentences. Farmers were quick to condemn the abuse, but also to defend the dairy industry's high animal welfare standards, considered um, by many to be amongst the best in the world. And then there's a quote from a dairy farmer: "The most painful part." Of it is that people will watch it and think that's the way all farmers treat their animals when that's absolutely not the case. There are thousands and thousands of farmers who look at, after their animals like they were family members. So, so, so that they are very common claims that we meet all the time. Hmm. We we love them. They're family members. We've got the best welfare in the world, and and if you expose anything. They try and obviously make it into a one bad apple situation, right? And in, and in fact, animal a, uh, animal equality did tackle that by saying, you know, we you can't dismiss this as, as one bad apple because every time we go into a place, we find this kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. that's that's what you the main point should be is that the fact is, well, these are rights violations that are everywhere, mm. you know, yeah. and so. So when we did a meet the victims in in Ireland, that was our claims making. We're saying, well, we've gone into this farm, but we could have been in the in the farm down the road or the or the farm over the hill, yeah. because they're all full of rights violations. They're all chock a box full of rights violations, and then there's going to be different levels of what you might argue to be animal cruelty, welfare violations of law, um, you know, people not doing the biosecurity very well. All that kind of stuff is going to be variable. The thing that's not variable is the fact that every single one, without exception, are chock full of, of animal rights violations. Yeah, I, I mean, it's important to, to um, put forward a case that's universal, something that covers all of these places. So people can't think, oh, well, perhaps I can get my milk or my meat from somewhere that's kind of so-called ethical you know that's the that's the difficulty i mean if someone says to me or oh, i go oh i get my you know my beef from an organic farm i say oh well, that, those are the animals that want to be slaughtered are they <laughs> you know i'll come up with that kind of a reply to start mm. a conversation you know because they're all slaughtered whether they're from an organic farm or as you say if they were kept on sofas and kind of you know. Yeah, Simon. Simon's point is interesting. Um, I, we were once we were doing a stall in uh, Temple Bar Square in in, um, in Dublin, and, the, and there's a pub just across the way fr from us. And this farmer came up and he goes, "Listen, mate, don't you try and tell me about farming. I'm a farmer, and we love our animals. We regard them as family members." And his daughter had gone into the pub, and I said, "Well, do you send you know your cattle to slaughter?" And he said, "Well, yeah." I said, so when are you going to send your daughter to slaughter? And he goes, okay, point taken, type of thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, because when they say that, it's just something for them to say because yes. they've actually got a difficult job in a way. I mean, I'm not, I'm not feeling sorry for them. Don't get me wrong. It's just that they're, they have to always slide into animal welfare and to, and to do a, emotional appeals like we love them, we're not like that. You know they're part of the family and, and all that kind of stuff and there's been a bit of a charm offensive from the farmers in a response to this panorama program but it's all about animal welfare and i i think again that sometimes it ends up being a battle between the vegans i mean this goes on on tiktok all the time the vegans who are trying to say that it's always terrible 
all the time and the farmers who are trying to say that it's not it's not so bad and certainly not as bad as you keep saying it is and i think that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle and it moves around on a spectrum you know crueler not so cruel all this kind of stuff but that that's not the fundamental issue no again no. we're always back to, to that that we're messing around with an argument that we don't necessarily want to make because our our argument is well look they're rights bearers and you're violating their rights and and you know we, i'm not i'm not going to argue with you about how cruel this that and the other is and i might i might even go to the extent of agreeing with them i mean like for example they would they would argue and not many vegans would even agree with this i don't think they would argue that artificial insemination is a welfare measure and that is true because but it's it's their fault but it's true because they've bred bulls monday bulls which are so massive that they cannot mount a female cow because they would break her hips mm. so they've got to arrange it that they they get them to mount either a structure or another bull and they call this other bull a teaser bull because they're strong enough to take the weight of the other bull but mm. the cow isn't and so from their point of view they're saying, well, this is a welfare thing because we're protecting the cows, which mm -hmm. is kind of true, but it's a problem that they made. Yeah, it's a little bit right. like debeaking. Debeaking was done for a reason, but the cause of it was because what, what they the farmers did. Yeah, yeah, because cut, they cutting, did. Cutting, up, cutting out the uh, the teeth of piglets and chopping their tails yeah. off. Yeah. All the same, they're trying to mitigate a problem that they have caused. Yes. Yeah. But you see, I, I mean, I've, I've had farmers say to me, oh, you know, come and look at my farm, um, see how well the animals are treated. And I said, no, there's no point in me looking at your farm because that's not going to change my view. And they say, well, why is that? And I said, well, you still send those animals for slaughter, don't you? And you send them for slaughter at a very young age, don't you? So that is what I'm opposed to. So what difference would it make me coming to look at your farm? You see, and so they're thinking, oh, you know, he can come and look at my farm, see how kind I am to the animals, and then he'd change his mind. Well, well, of course, I'm not going to. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, we, this is the last couple now. This, this is angle news. It's not angling. It's angle news. And, oh. um, this, is, this is one of the things that um, is very um, common. They, they were trying to do a charm offensive at the same time there was a lot of anger from the farmers they said that vegan activists have hijacked the bbc as, as you know like as if you know we wish um to smear the dairy industry and everything right um in, interestingly i'll tell you one thing that the because danny mentioned it before and also in the first video is that they made this distinction between the farm that they that the uh, animal quality filmed in and this ethical dairy farm the farmers never never engaged with that at all in their response which i i found really quite interesting Be because of course it was almost like saying well here's something that is so ethical but you couldn't do this because you couldn't afford it mm -hmm. yeah you know, it 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 it'd be outside their industry norm, so they they couldn't go with it. I'm gonna, but but all these publications are all are, are these all industry publications that just no no no. The Angle News is just a, new, a, a kind of news thing. Uh, there was a one before which was like a a regional paper. Oh right, um, yeah, yeah. You, there, there, you see, I think, I think one of them was the Times. I think. You see, well, you see, the thing is, if these are newspapers that that where people can write letters, then what I'd say if if anyone. I mean, the time may have gone now because this was a little while ago. But I'd say to it, you know, it, well, all vegans listening to this, that if you if if you get anything in your local news, if your local newspaper has a letters page, and you get anything in 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 the newspaper that you can write a letter in response to, and push the go vegan message, then do so, <coughs> because um, although newspapers aren't as read as much as they used to be and you know some local newspapers even go out of business because of course people get their news on the internet 
they're, they're nevertheless still read by thousands of people and the letters page in a local newspaper tends to be i think um there was some research that showed it was apart from the, the you know the front page it was the most looked at page because people are nosy about what other ordinary people are saying yeah that the, and the so, obituaries and stuff but yeah, so, so this, don't, don't forget that. That's another way of spreading the message. You only have yeah, to I, I agree with that. Animal ages would be very good at that. Um, but this raises a movement issue for me, Ronnie. For example, animal equality would have known what this film was going to look like before it came out. Now, if they were animal rights abolitionists, they'd be saying, okay, they're, they're going to, put out this stuff and there's going to be a lot of welfare this that and the other so get ready with your letters and whiz them in there as soon as it comes out and don't forget you know all the online stuff and all yep. the rest of it yeah yeah but, but of course they don't because they they are falling in with the welfare stuff as well rather than queuing their membership up to contradict it and that could be probably because they recognize that their membership are welfareists See, we, we, we're back to this problem that we're actually in a welfare movement. And so, therefore, making animal rights claims or even animal liberation claims is not that easy in a welfare movement because people are, are more comfortable talking about animal cruelty and abusers and carnists and these kind of things than I making think another, the, I, I the think case. Another around, aspect, aspect of it is with these kind of organizations that have, you know employ people and, and all that kind of thing is that they they have to have this kind of constant source of income and so if you have these kind of specific campaigns against specific places that you kind of label as particularly cruel and you want the place to shut down every time you launch one of those then you get a new lot of money you see whereas if all your campaign is saying look we all these places are, are all terrible and we want people to go vegan. If, that, if that's what your campaign is, then it isn't so much of a, 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 of a money spinner. And so I think the financial, you know, the, there's a financial reason for this as well. Well, that's exactly what Gary Francione has, has complained yeah. about since yeah. 1975, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes. 1996. Hmm. Because he's saying that the... Um, you know, the go vegan message doesn't sell as well as these single issues that you can ask for donations and stuff, you know. Yeah. And again, it's kind of disempowering in a, in, a, in a way because, you you know, once people have gone vegan, in in some senses, they don't need to come back to, to, to you then, do they? Because, the, you, you know, they've done it, as it were. Whereas if, if, if they've, you know, took part in the greyhound thing and then the giraffe thing and, you know, like you say, it's almost like a bit of a treadmill then. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's the same with like, like there was a big campaign, wasn't there, by Viva Close Hogwood Farm. And I think, have they got a campaign now? And that was aimed at Tesco. And they've got another one now aimed at Morrison's, haven't they? People have been outside Morrison's because Morrison's have get something from a place that was like exposed as being particularly cruel. And they want them, we want Tesco to stop buying pork from Hogwood Farm. But of course, if Tesco stopped buying pork from Hogwood Farm and the demand for pork uh, stays the same, then they're just going to get pork from another farm that's likely to be just as bad as Hogwood Farm, aren't they? You know, yeah, and, especially and if so you've got to have one farm that has got to suddenly increase its its yeah, volume. You see, see so <laughs> these campaigns impact the welfare, isn't it? Done, but they're done because they're done for the money. Now, I don't want to be overcritical of Viva because there's a lot of good stuff that Viva doing. It's the same with Animal Aid, you know, like the cameras in slaughterhouses thing now that, that you know i i always thought that was like totally ridiculous um but nevertheless they you know they do do things that promote veganism as well so this kind of you know um you know there's a good side and a not so good side to to these organizations but um those campaigns that aim at specific places close this place down or you know campaign against this supermarket get them to stop buying you know the pork or whatever it is from this place but that's not going to really spare any animals if that's all it is, because all they're going to do is just, all right, won't buy from that place to shut you up, and we'll just then get it from another place. No, mm, I agree with unless you. you. Unless you're promoting veganism at the same time. 
Well, we've been on for two hours, Ronnie, so I suppose we ought to. It, um, there's, there's still there's still 12 brave souls still watch, 12 uh, listening, people, to, <laughs> listening to us <laughs> waffle amazed. away. So if um, just just in case, I'll I'll put the I'll put the StreamYard link in the in the thing just in case somebody wants to come on for the last couple of minutes or something. If if you're burning to say something, then if you just um, copy and paste that link into a browser you'll get onto StreamYard, and then i can let you in if not we'll, we'll give you a couple of minutes to decide and if not we can thank you for your um comments as ever michael michael's bailing out <laughs> okay <enough>? michael take, <laughs> take care mate. michael <laughs> The time has just flown by. Yeah. When you're enjoying yourself talking about rights violations, eh, Deb? The thing about the thing about rights violations is, is I ordinary people don't kind of really I don't think in those terms. I don't think about right when, when you know my opposition to the oppression of other animals doesn't come because I have this thing going through my head that it's a rights violation. You know, I'm opposed to it because it's it's a it's oppression and, and stuff like that. You know that isn't kind of yeah. But being I mean, being I, oppressive I against somebody is a rights violation. I accept it is a rights violation. I haven't got any problem with 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 that. But it's just that that isn't. You know, when I form my position against it, that isn't what goes through my head. If you see what I mean, I don't think it goes through mm. the head of a lot of people. In a, in a sense that that would be why they kind of opposed it. They don't think well. I'm, you know, I'm opposed to like, you know, the Russians invading Ukraine because that's a rights violation. I don't think they kind of. I don't think people think like that, to be honest. Not ordinary people don't. No, but we're back to Donald Watson then, aren't we, Ronnie? On the right kind of, but thing. like, do we, you know, do we need to go there at all to actually get people, you know, if if, if you can, you, you see, what I try to do is, is, is like people, there are a lot of, you know, like most people are, are, are kind of, the sort of thing that, the, the thing that's done to um, things that are done to other animals, if those things were done to other humans, most people would be opposed to them. Yeah, most and people think, say that they're uh, human uh, rights. Or if violations. even, even <laughs> they were done to dogs or cats, most people would be opposed to them. And I think what we've got to do is get people to make that connection and get them to think that way. Yeah, but, but you know. all, all that is is you've got a non welfare fundamental. Which is things like oppression, tyranny, uh, yeah. the human right, and those that kind of claims making. My my non welfare yes. uh, fo foundational thing is is rights, and and I, and I, yes. I think if we could get people to think of other animals as rights bearers, I think that's a f a fundamental difference then because we're always going to come into conflict with other other animals. And that means then that if we think of them as fellow rights bearers, it alters the way that we orient towards that problem straight away. In in the same way as that we don't think, well, the way to solve the developing country's starvation problem is just to shoot them. Because we don't do that on the basis no. that we think, well, the, these are fellow rights bearers. But I don't think, the thing is, I don't think that is kind of, People's opposition to shooting people in other countries like that doesn't come because they've got a thing going through their head that those people are rights bearers. And they don't kind of, they don't kind of, that's not the process their mind goes through when they come to that, you know. Well, they'd say they're, it's they're, wrong. But you say, well, why is they it say, wrong? They say, they say, they just say, well, they, they kind of believe it's wrong. So kind of my approach would, to, would be to show them that, you know, oppressing other animals is equally as bad. And so they should be opposed to that as well. You know, that's kind of where I would, you know, make where I would make the argument. I mean, there may, yeah. you know, there may well be people that if you talk about rights bearers, yes, that's the way that those people would kind of, you know, be the best way. Of I, I, th I think those people, I think those people that you're talking about would get to rights fairly quickly because they'd go, oh, it's wrong. And then you go, well, why is it wrong? Well, it's not right. And you say, well, you don't don't, well to, why isn't it not right? I, I reckon they get to rights. They, they, yeah, they, they, they may do, may or may not do. But the thing is, 
that kind of doesn't even have to be mentioned because if you show that if they're already opposed to something being done to humans and you show them that you know it's just as bad to do that to other animals then they're going to be against other animals anyway, aren't they and that's kind of how i kind of look at it yeah zem's got a good point here because i've noticed that as well zem that um hmm. In in the human rights um, organizations like Amnesty and stuff, they've changed from saying human rights violations to human rights abuses, which is interesting in, in terms of, of our movement. That I noticed that their main claims making seems to be human rights abuses. I don't know whether they've done some focus groups and they've found out that this violation word is a bit abstract for people and that by using abuse is is better I, I i don't know and zem mentions the um nspcc which which ironically um the other thing ed talks about the nspcc in relation to the rspca in, in his in his new book and he, he makes a, this welfare claim that the rspca is a paradoxical organization which of course is not true they're just a traditional welfare group he says he says that the RSPCA should be like the NSPCC and that they both should be fighting against cruelty the way that the NSPCC does it. The problem with that is the NSPCC are not being given the job of taking millions of children through slaughterhouses. And so it's not no. a like-for-like -like situation. No. Because he, he was complaining about the fact that the RSPCA has got these manuals which tell people how to kill other animals in certain circumstances. Like, for example, yeah. if, a, if a cow is pregnant and the fetus comes out and the fetus is alive, what do you do then? So they've actually got guides to mm. say to slaughter uh, workers what to do. Well, the, the NSPCA yes. don't have to produce that kind of thing. It's not a like by like no, no. case at all. Yeah. You see, see, I think the RSPCA, there's a sense in which the RSPCA is encouraging people not to be vegan by, 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 through, through actually not supporting vegans. Because way back in the 1970s, the RSPCA was not opposed to hunting, was not opposed to hunting. And the hunts used this all the time. They said that they would say there can't be anything wrong with what we do because the RSPCA aren't opposed to us. The RSPCA mm. aren't saying that. Circus say that all the time as well, don't they? Circuses as well. Yeah. yeah, you see. And so that what that led to was there was a, a group was formed called the RSPCA Reform Group, um, and the aim of that was to change the policy of the RSPCA. And they did that. Um, they did it fairly quickly. It was all done in the 1970s. And, and what they did was it was get loads of people to join the RSPCA, like a load of hunt sabs and people from the league at school sports and all that, get loads of people to join. And then to vote onto their ruling council, onto their board um, at, at these annual elections, people that were opposed to hunting. So eventually <coughs> the, the nature of the people that ran the RSPCA changed and they, and they you know, actually... Um, came out against hunting and I think went so far as to, to ban anyone that was involved in hunting from membership of the RSPCA. Yeah, I was one of those people who joined. Yeah. Beryl, Beryl Spence yeah. got me to join. I mean, we turned up at either an AGM or an EG, EGM and we our job that particular day was to vote out the Queen as the patron of the RSPCA. Yes. I, I think I remember that. So, well, I certainly went to some of those. Yeah, so, so we did that. And then there was a lunch break, and then we came back, and the council announced that they'd reappointed the Queen as patron in the lunch break. <laughs> that, and I know, well, this is ridiculous. So, so all the votes of the membership counted for nothing. I mean, the way to change that was to vote people onto the council that were opposed to the Queen, and then that would have been it, you see. And this is why they went down the road of changing the, you know, the, the, the nature of the council members. Um, but I remember that. I mean, they used to be fighting at those AGMs and the police used to be called and everything. But you could always tell the, you always tell the, the, the vegan animal rights people because um, we'd be all wearing suits on smart clothes, but on our feet would be plimsolls. 
because at the time <laughs> yeah. you, at the time you couldn't really it was difficult to get vegan shoes that looked like your normal shoes so that's how you were able to sell the kind of <laughs> the vegans there and through the footwear um but yes and that succeeded and 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 i think that and, and the reason that was important was the the, the um the RSPCA weren't saying we support hunting. It was just the fact that they weren't against it that was used. And and it's kind of similar, I think, with, um, you know, with animal farming. And, and even worse, really, because they've got all this, all, all this stuff about, you know, um, you know, how to kill animals and everything. You know, the, the farming community can say, well, the RSPCA aren't opposed to us. So there can't be anything wrong with what we're doing. You know? No, but what what would clear up a lot of confusion in our movement though is is for because when when Earthling Ed put his film out a cartoon, loads of people said, "Oh, I thought the RSPCA was a vegan group. I'm going to cancel my subscription." Turned out, because I asked them on Twitter, I said, w "You know why? You know, surely you know that the RSPCA is is a traditional animal welfare group that they're there to regulate." use not to end it and all this kind of stuff and all that except for selected things that, that they might choose you know hair coursing or something and they came back and said well it's because they've got cruelty prevention of cruelty in their name so it seems to me that the our use in the abolitionist vegan movement of the word cruelty all the time it kind of like got people to think that the rspca must also be an abolitionist vegan group and and they were shocked to find that it wasn't it's, and I, uh, yeah. I wrote a blog entry and said it's not the RSPCA's fault that you think the RSPCA is a vegan group. They've never claimed to be a vegan group. But, but those people couldn't have looked very much into the RSPCA because you don't have to spend too long looking on their website to, to see that they do endorse San Well, Wall. that's what they said. I mean, they said, mm -hmm. I'm cancelling my subscription. So why did they subscribe in the first place? If they were going to be offended well, by the fact that they want a vegan organization. So they're upset that a non-vegan organization is not a vegan organization. I, I think a lot of a lot of kind of new vegans kind of there's a lot they don't understand apart from like you don't eat animal products. I mean, I've seen, for instance, on social media, I've seen um vegans promoting fundraisers for uh organizations like Cancer Research UK and the yeah, Rich Heart yeah. Foundation, and I've had the post thing saying, I, I, "Were you aware that they fund experiments on animals?" And they're not aware. You know, these vegans aren't aware that that is the case. Whereas back in the day, we'd have been immediately aware, wouldn't we, of things like that? So it's like, other than like a lot of new vegans, apart from just the kind of diet thing, they're not so, they're not aware of the other stuff all around the outside of it, really. It's a bit of an irony, isn't it, Ronnie? Yeah. I mean, they, they've got the internet now. Yeah, I think it's just where the emphasis is really on things. I mean, you know, back in the day, there was a lot of em emphasis on animal experiments, wasn't there? You know, within the animal rights movement and, you know. Um, but but do, does, it does it challenge your position, my position and Gary Francion's position? Because you said in your re recent interview, if we'd have started vegan education sooner, we'd be a lot further down the road. But we would be a lot further down the road of people who don't know vivisection stuff as well, wouldn't we? Well, well it depends on that. If, if it was vegan, I mean, of course, vegan education is it kind of may start off with the, with the food, but it's a lot more than that. I mean, veganism is, um, you know, is an animal liberation philosophy so you know um somebody's a vegan would be opposed to animal experiments and to circuses and to all these things well so, we all buy into the rhetoric don't we that there's yeah. been a big increase in veganism in the last 10 years uh Dan danny says the last five years said that a couple of times but in some ways has there because you've got a lot of people who don't know what veganism really is there's been a, a big increase in people that who've adopted a vegan diet. How many yeah. of those people are actually vegans in terms of that they, they're animal liberationists? Who knows? Yeah. You know, well, the, the last the time I, I'm uh, just, just to t t tell people in the chat that um, we're, we're doing another cheese giveaway in Dublin tomorrow. And um, we normally got the, the Elvis impersonator, but he's got the flu. Elvis has got the flu. The king has got the flu. But um, <laughs> the, the last the last time we did it, we had a, at least five people, might have even been seven, but certainly five people came up 
and they declared themselves vegan or that their relative or something like that was vegan. And then they started to talk about eating fishes, e eating dairy cheese and this kind of stuff. And one of our people said, well, that's not vegan. And they, they had all these different versions of vegan in, in their head, these people. You know, and it makes you wonder about all those non-activists, about whether they're in a similar boat. And, you know, if they turned up at an activist event, they'd almost like be found out as not really vegan. And I know that's a terribly kind of negative and divisive thing to say. But, I mean, if we've got a lot of people who are now plant-based, call themselves vegan, and then we think in our divisive way that we do, well, you're not really vegan, which is a her terrible thing to say, but it's true, right? Yeah, it, 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 it is true. And I think we'll, all we've got to do is just keep emphasising what veganism is. Uh, and, and maybe those people will become vegan. Perhaps they'll start off by being just, you know, plant-based or uh, start off by uh, switching to a vegan diet and then learn more and, and, and then actually become vegan. Because it's like a kind of... Um, in a sense, it's a gateway, isn't it? Like I, I kind of look at single issues as a gateway if they're handled in the right way. Probably handled in the way that Gary Francione would like to see them handled. <laughs> you know, where um, you know, they're used as a, a kind of means to educate people um, to go vegan. They're, they're the thing that attracts the, the, the attention of people. Do you, Do you think it's yeah. working? Do you think that if if you're using the kind of model that we were talking about with Danny, people can come into the movement in any kind of way and then they'll they'll learn the ethics. But if people come in as, let's use the pejorative, as cupcake vegans, do, do a lot of those become activists, do you think? Or is there, resi is there resistance there? Because you're I, always complaining that not many are doing it. I think there is. I, 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 yeah, the, um, yeah, not many are. And... and um... Why? Enough, why, why aren't why aren't they? Um, because I think that's just um, I think it's to do with <laughs> because they're humans and humans are, they tend to be wanting to be passive and concentrate on kind of the little things that are going on in their life rather than kind of you know I think that that's but it's just you it's just constantly. Um, emphasizing to those people the importance of being active now we'll, we'll probably always have the majority of them that aren't active but we just need a sufficient number to be active and a sufficient number to become organizers in order to change things yeah but and the, thing, but, the, but the, is the point is you, you you are always emphasizing ronnie that active doesn't mean cubes and it doesn't mean this and yeah. it could mean leaflet dropping, um, yes. stand, standing at a stall, doing a community kind of thing, yeah, uh, and doing doing something very kind of passive, you know, writing to newspapers and everything. Yes. So you've actually brought the the bar of activism down, and and still people seem not to go there either. Uh, no, and and I think kind of what the situation is. I think in a sense that. Um, Kind of veganism has, in a sense, become like vegetarianism used to be, as it's become easier and easier to live like a vegan. Like you used to get, like you know, you know, back back in the day, um, as I said earlier, that if someone was a vegan, they were very very likely to be an activist. If someone was a vegetarian, that wasn't the case. You know, a lot of people would just happen to be vegetarian. Uh, uh, you know, because it was like so easy to be a vegetarian. Oh, yes, I'm, I do all this, I do that and that. And, oh, yes, and I'm a vegetarian. So if somebody was a vegan and you asked them about themselves, the, probably the first thing they'd say was that they were a vegan because it was much more difficult to live as a vegan in those days. Because as it's become kind of easier, pe people are, are, tend to become just vegan in the sense that people used to be vegetarian, that they're kind of vegan by the way. Because it's kind of so easy to get, and I think that's kind of what, what one of the things, one of the reasons is because you know because it's like attracted people that are kind of not maybe not activists in their makeup because it's so much easier to do. 
so much easier to because like you know back in the day it was easier to be an activist than it was to live as a vegan because it was so kind of difficult to mm -hmm. eat out it was you know complicated to get stuff like loads of bread had used to have animal fat in and it, you know it was kind of <laughs> you know it, it wasn't it, it you know it was much more difficult than it is today to live as a vegan and so you had to be a pretty determined person to kind of do that and i think that you know that kind of went hand in hand with people being you know being activists and that isn't the case now and put, and themselves, that's, put that's themselves out a bit more what, what do you make yeah. of deb saying sadly a lot of vegans think that just being vegan is enough now i personally don't like this kind of claim but i understand it yes i think i think a lot of people think well i've ticked that box you know i you know i'm getting on with my life doing all the, the these things that i enjoy in my life and oh dear you know i found out about what happens to animals so i'm going to kind of become vegan i'm going to consume a vegan diet and having done that having ticked that box i can carry on exactly as i was before yeah so my, it's, my it's conscience it's, clear it's a label problem then, isn't it? Because De Deb has carefully put the word vegan in inverted commas. She means plant-based, right? Well, it, they, they, they could even be, it depends if, you, if, if veganism is looked at. Um, I mean, according to the vegan society definition, veganism is purely an avoidance thing, isn't it? It's, it's about what you don't do. No, no, the you first thing, no, no. It's, I think it, a, I think a lot of vegans claim that, but it, it the first thing it says it's a philosophy. Oh, so check out. Yeah, somebody can hold a philosophy and not be active in promoting it. You see, it, uh, 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 and the, the vegan society definition is, is all about what you don't do. Is you don't you don't involve yourself. You, you try to avoid uh, involvement in the oppression of other animals, basically. You know, mainly through. Yeah, but but you know, com conversely the though, there's nothing in a. There's nothing in in the word philosophy that that suggests inaction either. And no, so, but it, doesn't, it doesn't suggest action. I mean, philosophy, you know, that they believe it, it, that it's wrong that animals should be oppressed, and they don't want to be part of it. What about the word opposition? Now, you see, I mean, 1945, Donald Watson said that veganism was about opposing the exploitation of other sentient life. He called it. Well, well once, again, it, once again, it depends whether that that is active opposition you can be opposed to something and not do anything about it that can just be your personal view that you don't agree with it and i think mm. that that kind of is so, so people according to that definition i think people can actually be genuine vegans but not activists um whether that ties in with you know what the early vegans wanted because of course you know, to define veganism, we've got to look back to, I, I, I say you've got to look back to Leslie Cross, really. He was the first person yeah. to define veganism. And what, what did Leslie Cross say and what did Leslie Cross want? And our definition of veganism needs to be based on that. Well, he, well, he said we're on the side of the liberators. He also says we're not uh, as much welfare as we're um, animal liberation. So he, he always implied activism. Uh, yeah, Zem, yes, Zem's point here, um, what do you think of the common uh, claim that veganism is an inaction? I, I, I know what it means because of what you just said, Ronnie, but I really yeah. don't like it because I tend to think of veganism as implying an active opposition. That's the way I always interpret it. But I understand yeah. how you could say it could be a passive opposition. It's an oppositional stance that's not necessarily active. So I understand yeah, yeah, the I, point. I, I don't like yeah. it at all. I resist it. Well, no, I mean, I don't like it either because I think um, there should be um, an active component. And I think there's enough in what um, Leslie Cross said. I think it does imply that. And I think that, you know, that, that there should be an active component to it. I just think that a lot of vegans don't believe that there should be and that they can call themselves vegan without being activists. And I think people do think it's enough. I've ticked that box. Okay. You know, so I can just carry on. But the, the point is that we're not going, if, if those people genuinely want animal liberation and, you know, if, you know, they're people that um, are opposed to all these things, then those things aren't going to end and, 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 and unless loads of vegans become active. So, so they, they, they believe in a thing, but they're not doing what is necessary to achieve the thing that they believe in. You see, 
And that doesn't have to be, as you said, it doesn't have to be a big thing. If lots of people did small things, then loads of stuff would happen and loads. Because we all we all became vegan because we received information in one way or another, whether that was a leaflet, an article we read, the video we saw, a poster. And, and quite often it was there'd be several instances of, you know, being exposed to that information before we would decide that we wanted to become vegan. And so yeah, the more you, informa- you, yeah, just, you, you tend to think that being vegan implies advocating for veganism, whereas obviously people think that being vegan is a personal decision that they've embraced. And I suppose if somebody asked them about their veganism, they would answer, but they wouldn't be proactive in the way that you suggest everyone should be. Um, no, but you see, it, 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 but those people, um, the fact that those people are refraining from involvement um, or, or doing their best to refrain from involvement in the oppression of other animals means that they're opposed to that oppression and surely they'd like to see a world where that oppression no longer existed. But unless we educate uh, a large number of people to become vegan, we're never going to uh, achieve that world. So those people are believing in a thing and wanting a thing, not doing what is necessary to achieve it. And yeah, that is something that... That, that was the basis of me saying that Donald Watson said it's about the opposition of, of exploitation. That... Well, it is about the opposition of exploitation, but I'd say it's about active, the active opposition, and not just not just having a view that you're opposed to it. Uh, and and saying that you're opposed to it, but actually going out there and spreading that message and educating other people, because that's the only way we're going to turn things around. Uh, and if people want to see this world, you know, I'd say an animal liberation society where vegans are the, you know, we, we're the ones that kind of say what goes. And in order to have that, a, lot, a, a, a large number of people do need to be vegan. We're not going to get that unless there's a lot more education goes on and a lot more information is spread. So people really want that. They've got to become active in some way, even in a small way. And we need more people to organise stuff. And people need to think about what can I do where I live? Can I organise something? Can I get together? There's vegans everywhere, you know. So can I get together with a few other vegans locally and do some local stuff in this area and educate people? That's what we all need. All vegans need to be thinking about. It's not a big deal. It's not really a big deal. You're not going to go to prison or anything. (laughs) No. Yeah, jo- Jonah here says that there's been a big rise again uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so, 12. Health vegans, raw, raw fruitarian, uh, these um, bikini persons. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've had mine on a few times, I must admit, Roger. Um, but, uh, well, that, that, that put a few people that. off, Ronnie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I don't want to talk too much about it. Um, yes, I think that you know that's that's true. But they're not vegans. If, if, if people adopt a vegan diet for for reasons other than animal liberation, they're not vegan. You know, they're not a vegan. They're a you know somebody that eats a vegan diet, you know, for the environment, or somebody that eats a vegan diet for health, or is plant based for health, or plant based for the environment. It, it's a divisive. It's a divisive thing to say in the same way. As I could say, if you're not an animal rights advocate, then you're not an animal rightist. You're something else. So call yourself animal liberation, not yeah. animal rights. But but you see, with veganism is what it is. If if we're going to, you know, determine what veganism is, we have to look back to the people who actually defined it in the first place. And it's quite clear, you know, from Leslie Cross's definition that it's a philosophy of animal liberation, and that's what it is. You know, it is what it is. And, and so <laughs> whether people like it or not, it is what it is. You know, stop trying to change it. If, if you want to, you know, kind of, you know, not be an animal liberationist, but to kind of, you know, uh, eat, a, eat, eat, eat <clears throat> a vegan diet for whatever reason, then, then don't call yourself a vegan because you're not. You know. What, 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 what about my situation where they did use the word liberation more than they i mean like i mean they were writing 30 years before tom reagan so they did say things like uh, that we don't have the right and this kind of stuff but they don't and they also talked about giving rights to other animals which is again a, a bit of a mistake in terms of animal rights theory but they they definitely talked about liberation more than they did about rights and so am i wrong to suggest that veganism is about animal rights no i don't think so because i think that can be 
because you know people aren't necessarily going to um, have spoken in the same way in those days than they do now. You know, language was different. The way that people kind of and when we are talking about how many years ago is it um, seventy years or more? Seventy five years? How, that, when, when was it? Forty four? So that being society was formed. Yeah, Leslie, Leslie Cross was doing his most most um, writing between 51 and 55. Yeah, it was 51, the def his definition. So that's 50, 70, 71 years, isn't it? It's a long yeah, time yeah. ago and, and language has changed. So we've got to kind of interpret um, what they were saying, what he was saying in, in, in today's language. Um, but it's quite quite definitely a, a philosophy of animal liberation. Yes, animal rights as well. Yeah, yeah. I, you know. Um, well, believe it or not, Ronnie, we, we've still got 12 people, but uh, your phone is starting to crack up a bit more than it, it was. So this uh, might be, this might be a good time. This might be a good time to say, let, let, say let, goodbye let to people. everyone. <laughs> we, we, we've, we've been going for two and a half hours. That's long enough. Nobody's nobody going to watch the recording now because of that. And, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just split up into 10 minute sections or something. But probably so, yeah. And, and, you know, put it out over the next two years. Yeah, yeah. I'll 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 put it with clickbait titles. You know, um, uh, Hunter destroys vegan or something. You know, part two. You know that kind of thing. Or vegan destroys Hunter. I suppose we want vegans to watch it. Ah, well, it's weird because the the influencers do it the other way around, don't they? I mean, like just. Oh, I just, don't know. I don't really. Yeah, I mean, mm. if you even look at the uh, the famous book, Ed Ed uh, Winters, it's kind of like it's kind of like the opposite way. You know, vegan propaganda kind of thing. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Maybe that works. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But thanks anyway, for, folks. For, for bearing with us, and you can go and lie down in a darkened room now when we've gone. <laughs> <laughs> Split it into tweets. Yeah, that'd be that'd be that'd be great, wouldn't it? Three, three hours of tweets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that'd take a hundred <laughs> years then. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'll I'll get onto that straight away, Zem. Thanks for the uh, for the tip. And um, brilliant. Thanks for everybody. And I'm going to click the button and say goodbye. Take care, everyone. Bye.